I would never have thought that a day would come when the Malangi ideology, Malangism, would make inroads into Hoja communities. I never thought, I mean, Hoja and Malang seemed like an oxymoron to me in the early period. But when I was in Stanmore, I was shocked to learn that some of our Hoja youth, who are part of the center in Stanmore, have actually become, they have been won over to the side of the Malangs, who are very active in the UK and in Europe in general. So if anything, that shows you the rising tide of Rolo is something that no one is really safe from. And it is my fear that if we, the speakers, the scholars, the researchers, people of knowledge, if we don't do enough, Rolo is going to overwhelm our communities. Because the Rolo, since the time of the Imams, they had one very unfortunately powerful weapon with which they were able to bulldoze and silence any and all opposition which was the Ghulat, they came forward and they said, look, we are not inventing stuff from our pocket. This is what the Imam said. So everything was attributed to the Imam and everything they promoted, all the un-Islamic nonsensical khurafat at the level of belief and practice that they promoted, they did so in the name of the Imams and they did so in the name of the love of the Imams. So all the un-Islamic practices, beliefs, innovations that they want to introduce, they have one weapon that they will use shamelessly and notoriously and that is love of Ahlul Bayt and because the youths have that Alhamdulillah in our communities youths are full of love for Ahlul Bayt this love for Ahlul Bayt is a strong point it is supposed to be a strong point but Shaitan will turn it into a weak point just as he did with the Christians so love for Isa alayhi salam and veneration of Isa alayhi salam was technically speaking a strong point of the Christians the early Christians who were actually Muslims according to the Quran but that very same strong point was turned into a weak point because later on when the Hulu emerged in Christianity, everything was just about, do you love Jesus or not? Now, if you love him, you have to accept he's the son of God. You shouldn't have any problem with accepting that he's the son of God. And then later on, you have to accept that he's part of the Trinity. And if you resist it, no, no, you, do you not love Christ? If you love Christ, you shouldn't have any problem accepting that he's part of the divinity, that he's the son of God. And obviously, we're not saying he became the son of God all by himself. No, it takhad Allah walad, as the Quran says. The Quran is very clear. They said God has taken him as his son. So put it on God. In the way today in Ghulu and in all Ghali claims, they say, Ilmul Ghaib, no, Allah gave it to them. No, the power to respond to supplications across the curtain of life, Allah gave it to them. The power to see everything, hear everything, know everything, Allah gave it to them. Put it on Allah and it's all okay. No, that's what the Christians did. They did not put... The, they did not ascribe sonhood to Isa alayhi salam and say that Isa alayhi salam acquired this honor by himself. Say so, no, no, no. Allah has honored him. Allah is the one who has done it. And they felt, well, if Allah is doing it, then who are we to? But the question that Allah asked them is, In عِنْدَكُمْ مِنْ سُلْطَانٍ بِهَذَا hey, Where is your authority for playing this? If I had taken him as my son, surely I would have informed you of this somewhere in the book, in the scripture. You have no sultan, you have no authority. You're making a claim without evidence. So in any case, our youths have this strong point, love for Ahlul Bayt, which the Ghulat, the Malangs, and all these deviant ideologies will use to their, for their interests. And that's why Imam Abu Abdullah Jafar ibn Muhammad al-Salih he makes a special appeal to the elders, leaders of the community, parents. In Amali Sheikh Tusi, Sheikh Abu Jafar Muhammad bin Hassan Tusi narrates with his sonad from Imam Salih al Islam that he said, Addressing the elders of the community and the parents, he says, Watch out for your youth and be vigilant in protecting them against the Ghulat, these doctrinal, ideological extremists who are going to use the love of Ahlul Bayt, who are going to use the banner and umbrella of Wilaya to deceive people into believing in and practicing things that are contrary and that fly in the face of the teachings of Islam. So the Imam said, Be vigilant, watch out for your youth, protect the youth against these proponents of Ghulu. I do not want to see them corrupting the minds of our youths. Because if you're not careful, if you're not vigilant, if you're not proactive, they will get to your youth. 
And for them, the task is very easy. You know, for you, it's an uphill task. To, to, to fight against Ghulu is an uphill task because the Ghulat will immediately label you as being anti Ahlul Bayt or the way they used to do in the time of the Imams. They labeled some of the greatest companions of Imams. They said, no, no, these people are not true lovers of Imam. They are demoting his position. It's just like among the Christians, if you start saying, if a Christian starts saying, Isa is not the son of God, he's not the Lord and Savior, he's not, they'll say, oh, you're the Antichrist and you've been influenced by Antichrist movements. You're against Christ. When the reality is denying, because they feel for a Christian, when you say Isa is not the son of God, you're demoting him. When the reality is you're not demoting him, this attribution, calling him the son of God, this was a false elevation. So when you, when you fight against that false elevation, it appears that you're demoting Jesus, but actually you're not. You're setting the record straight and you're giving him the position of that Allah gave him. Allah says, what are you talking this son and, and Lord and Savior? In huwa illa abdun an'amna alayhi wa ja'alnahu hudan li bani Israel. He is just a slave. That's it. And Amna Ali, we gave him an Am, we favored him, we blessed him, we bestowed upon him our special favors, but at the end of the day, those favors don't change his essence. He's still a slave. You take you're turning him to something that's not that's beyond the scope of a slave. That's where the problem lies in Christianity. So in Hua illa Abdu. And then Allah clarifies not just Isa alayhi salam is Abd. In Surah Maryam, towards the end, he says, "In كُلُّ مَنْ فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ إِلَّا آتِ الرَّحْمَنِ عَبْدًا There is nothing in the heavens and the earth except that it, when it appears in front of Allah, it appears in only one capacity, and that is as his slave. Whether it is Rasulullah or any prophet, any wali, any angel, every entity is a slave. So that's why the Imam is saying, that look, لا يفسدوهم يحذروا على شبابكم الغلات لا يفسدوهم Protect your youth, be, be careful. These غلات will get to your youth because they have a weapon that is going to resonate with the youth. The youth love Ahlul Bayt and the غلات say, well, you love Ahlul Bayt? We are elevating the Ahlul Bayt. Come and join us. And people like us who then set the record straight and deny and reject using the teachings of the Imams, we reject these false claims, no, 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 you are demoting the Ahlul Bayt. Of course, when you have raised the Ahlul Bayt to a position that they did not claim for themselves, and then we assert and clarify their actual position, it's going to appear to you, if you're influenced by Ghulu, it's going to appear to you that these people are against Ahlul Bayt, billah. they're bringing their station down. Actually, we are setting the record straight, and we're doing so in light of their teachings. Because they define Ghulu as الَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ فِينَا مَا لَا نَقُولُهُ فِي أَنفُسِنَا the ghulu is basically to make any claim about us, Imam al-Baqir al-Islam says, which we have not made about ourselves. So that's our entire life's work, is researching what the Ahlul Bayt actually said about themselves. And after researching and reading the writings of the senior ulama, scholars of Rijal, ulama of Usul, the conclusion is very clear, that all these exaggerated supernatural attributes and claims that are being ascribed to the Ahlul Bayt, the Ahlul Bayt never claimed them. And the narrations in which you see them claiming, if you study their asanid, their chains, they are notorious ghulat who have been discredited, expelled from the city of Qom, who have been cursed by the imams. And you're taking narrations from these people. This is the problem. So that's why the imam says, look, I have warned you against the ghulat and I've specifically asked you to be careful about our youth because the youth will easily flow. The youth have that emotional, sometimes youths tend to be more emotional than academic and intellectual. And this is a very favorable quality for the ghulat. The ghulat are all about emotional blackmail. Do you love the Ahlul Bayt? Then you accept what we tell you about them. When we elevate their station, we give them supernatural powers, you should not protest. Even if the Imams do not claim it, doesn't matter. We are claiming it. We are going to bring different kinds of logical arguments, you just accept what we tell you. That was the mantiq and the rhetoric of the ghulat. So in any case, the Imam says, beware of the ghulat. Don't let your youth slip into their clutches because, listen to this statement of Imam. He says, In the eyes of Imam al-Sadiq, he's saying the ghulat 
are the worst of God's creation in our eyes. Can you imagine? In the name of the love of Ahlul Bayt, these people are going to turn you into the worst creations in the sight of the Ahlul Bayt. Say, so, yeah, Imam, on what grounds are you saying they are the worst creations of Allah? I mean, there is a there is a very tough competition if you want to qualify for the dubious distinction of being the worst creation of Allah. You have a lot of competition. You have Fir'aun and Namrud and Hamad. You have all kinds of bad hombres and really shady characters that you have to beat to this title. But yeah, the Imam says the Hulaka right there. They are they qualify as being the worst of God's creation. Yeah, Imam, why? He says because you saghiruna azamat Allah. These people are reducing the azama. They are minimizing. They are undermining the greatness of Allah. They belittle the greatness of Allah. وَيَدَّعُونَ الرُّبُوبِيَةَ لِعِبَادِ اللَّهِ And they are claiming rububiya. Yani the sifat of Allah which make him our Rabb, our Lord, our guardian, our protector. The sifat like he's all seeing, all hearing. He's the one who responds. أَمَّا يُجِبُ الْمُصْبَرَّ إِذَا دَعَاهُ وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءُ All these sifat that because of which we call Allah our Rabb. That he's the one, he's the reliever of distress. He's the one who grants us rizq. He's the one who creates us. He's the one who sustains us. He's the one who gives us life and death. He's all these functions. He's the one who is running the affairs of the universe. All of these rububiyati sifat. Yadda'oon al-rububiyata li'ibadillah. Imam Sadiq says these ghulat, they want to transfer the sifat of Allah that make him our Rabb, our Lord. They want to transfer these lordship qualities to the slaves of Allah. By slaves of Allah, they're referring to themselves. Because the Imams were first and foremost the slaves of Allah. Right? فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ اتَّخَذَنِي عَبْدًا قَبْلَ أَنْ يَتَّخِذَنِي رَسُولًا As Rasulullah himself said, that Allah took me as a slave first, and then he made me a Rasul. I was first a slave and then a, a prophet. And that's why when in Tashahud you say, Ashadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. You first testify to his slavery before Allah. That he's a slave. And Allah is the master and the guardian and the protector. So, yadda'una rububiyyata li ibadillah. This is Imam Sadiq's problem with the ghulat. Is that they are taking Allah's unique sifat, which Allah in the Quran advertises openly as his sifat. That, أَمَّن يُنَجِّيكُمْ فِي ظُلُمَاتِ الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ Who is the one who relieves you in the darknesses, the dark recesses of the land and the sea. Huh? Who is the one أَمَّ يُجِيبُ الْمُصْدَرَّ إِذَا دَعَاهُ وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءُ Who is the one who responds to the call of the distressed when he calls out to him and removes the evil from him? And if you go by today's Ghulu ideology, which has become popular among the Shia, it's not only Allah who does that. Even though Allah rhetorically, he asks the question, أَإِلَاهُمْ مَعَ اللَّهُ أَمَّن يُجِيبُ الْمُصْدَرَّ The full verse is what? أَمَّن يُجِيبُ الْمُصْدَرَّ إِذَا دَعَاهُ وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءَ وَيَجْعَلُكُمْ خُلَفَاءَ الْأَرْضِ أَإِلَاهُمْ مَعَ اللَّهُ Allah is asking me the question, is there any other God besides me or together with me who can do this? In essence, Allah is saying, I am the only, the one and only who can listen to the calls of all those who call out to me in distress. No one else can do that. And no one else has the power or has been empowered with the power to do this except me. The ghulat, they disagree. They beg to differ. They say, no, no, no. Allah has also given the sifat to the imams with his permission. The imams never claimed this. The imams of Ahlul Bayt, look at Imam Sajjad salam in the du'as that you read. In Shahru Ramadan, Makarim al-Akhlaq. Allahumma ja'alni asoolu bika inda al-darura wa as'aluka inda al-haja wa la taftinni bi su'ali ghayrika إذا افتقرت. He says, Ya Allah, grant me the tawfiq that whenever I'm in need, I should turn to you and you alone. And do not allow me to spread my hands before any of your creations when I'm in need. So the way of the Imams, and we can go on quoting, quoting du'as of the Imams in which they have made statements like this, which agree with the Quran. Ultimately, these du'as, we authenticate them on grounds of their agreement with the Quran. Because what the Quran is preaching, Ud'uni as-sajib lakum, Allah is saying, call upon me and I'll answer you. Don't make dua to entities other than Allah. The Quran is supporting this and Ahlul Bayt are also supporting this in their duas. Alhamdulillah alladhi adu'uhu wa la adu'u ghayrahu wa law da'awtu ghayrahu lam yastajib du'ai. Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salatu wassalam is saying 
that all praise belongs to Allah. He is the one I make my du'as to. I address him with my du'as and he responds to them. For if I were to address my du'as to anyone other than Allah, lam yastajib du'ai, he would not respond to my du'a. Anyone other than Allah. And anyone means anyone. Rasulullah, the angels, imams, awliya, everyone comes under anyone. But no, the ghulat don't want to accept this. So that's why the imam is saying, this is our problem with the ghulat, is that they want to reduce the azma of Allah. Obviously, once you accept the ghulu ideology, Allah is placed on the back burner. Allah is just there for na'udhu billah, for show. Everything else, every, all the universal functions, wila taqwiniya, you have given to the imams. When you are falling down, ya Ali madad. When you are in trouble, ya Ali madad. You are asking imams for help. When you are sick, imam will give shifa. When you are traveling, imam is dhamin. Everything imam, imam is one of the reformist scholars said, إِذَنْ فَمَاذَا أَبْقَيْنَا لِلَّهِ He said, then what have we left for Allah? Allah, na'udhu billah, is just a showpiece. Na'udhu billah. What have you left for Allah? You've taken all of the unique functions that he repeatedly attributes to himself alone in the Quran. You've taken them and given them to his slaves. And this is what Imam Sadiq is saying. This is why he's saying anyone who does this is the worst creation of Allah. Allah. You're placing Allah on the back burner. And you are claiming rububiya for the slaves of Allah. And then look at the anger of Imam Sadiq He says, Wa inna al-ghulata sharrum min al-yahudi wal nasara wal majus wal ladhina ashraku. He says, these ghulat in our eyes, they are worse than the Jews and the Christians and the majus who, and those who are proper mushrik. So, unfortunately, this is what our youths, it saddens us to see. We, we don't have any uh, agenda as such or, you know, we don't have any personal motivation in this. All we are motivated by in the Al-Islah series is concerned for this fact that what the Imams were warning us against, our community has fallen into it. Our youths are falling into this. And very soon a time will come if we don't do enough. Alhamdulillah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless platforms like Al-Islah and their administration and all the members who have written to us uh, with their support and all those who are supporting in, in spreading these alternative researches. Because this you need to do this. If you don't combat the tide of Ghulu, it will completely consume you. And it is already consumed. We, we've already seen. You, you come to this country and I will show you scenes here. People performing sujood, people making dua in sujood to Ghayrullah, to Imams. You don't know what's going on at the ground level. If you knew, you would understand that what the Imams were warning against has actually become a reality. So we are not motivated by anything except by a sincere desire to defend the vision that the Imams of Ahlul Bayt gave us, whereby they said, look, let Allah be Allah, and we are his slaves. We came to teach you about Allah so that all the hesitation you have connecting with Allah, there are so many hesitations that block you. This is the greatest favor that Ahlul Bayt did on this Ummah, is that they taught us and they didn't only do, do this for the Shia, by the way. Muhammad ibn Muslim ibn Shihad al-Zuhri is a great scholar of Ahl sunnah al-Jama'ah in the time of Imam Sajjad a.s. He once committed a crime because of which he lost hope in the mercy of Allah. He's like, after this, Allah is not going to forgive me because it involved the blood of a Muslim. Fortunately, he ended up contributing to the shedding of the blood of a Muslim, for which Allah himself has said in the Quran, وَمَنْ يَقْتُ الْمُؤْمِنَ مُتَعَمِّدًا فَجَزَاؤُهُ جَهَنَّمُ خَالِدًا فِيهَا وَغَضِبَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَلَعَنَهُ وَأَعَدَّ لَهُ عَذَابًا Azima. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says anyone who kills a mu'min intentionally and deliberately then on such a person is the curse and anger of Allah and such a person will be in the fire of hell forever. So Muhammad ibn Muslim is a scholar he knows all of this and that's why once he falls into the sin he says I'm done and he despairs in the mercy of Allah. When Imam Sajjad is passing by him he says what because he had Abandoned everything. He was sitting there like a madman. This scholar, Muhammad ibn Muslim. And he had gone crazy because of the guilt. And Imam Sajjad asked about him and the people told him. He said, you know what? His crime that he first did, is a, it's a major crime, no doubt. But it is not greater than the crime that he is now involved in. So what crime is he now involved in? He said, losing hope in the mercy of Allah. Even if you commit the worst crime, you're not allowed to lose hope in the mercy of Allah.
And when this scholar hears of this, it's a, it's a moment of realization for him. And he repents, he does istighfar, he tries to do islah after that. And later on he says, I will never be able to repay my debt to Abu Hassan Ali ibn Hussain Zain al because he is the one who literally saved me. He is the one who, who gave me the ma'rifah I needed to reconnect with Allah because I had lost hope. So this is the really real beauty of the teachings of our Imams is that they came to connect you to Allah. They came to enhance your ma'rifah of Allah. Unfortunately, under the influence of Ghulu, we ended up forgetting this mission of theirs and we, we made them the focus of our devotion and our attention, which they would never have wanted. So we are motivated in this entire series by, our, uh, by a sincere feeling of sadness for what's going on, how the original teachings of the Imams are being trampled upon, how people have moved away from the vision of Imams, how people, instead of devoting themselves to Allah, are devoting themselves to Imams, thinking Imams will be happy, when the reality is the Imams say nothing can please us, except if we see you fully devoted to Allah. We ourselves spent our entire lives, our focus was always on Allah. Inna salati wa nusuki wa mahiyaya wa mamati lillahi rabbil alameen. Amir al in the last moments of his life, he's reciting this verse. That indeed my salah, my sacrifice, my life, my death, everything is for Allah. Today in our communities, Allah is being replaced by the Imams. Everything now is for the Imam. Even now at the level of the mimbar, before it used to be said, you know, don't commit sins because Allah is watching. Now it's no longer Allah is watching. And even if he's watching, it doesn't matter. The Imam is watching you. When did the Imam ever say I'm watching you? On the day of judgment, prophets are testifying that وَكُنْتُ عَلَيْهِمْ شَهِيدًا مَا دُمْتُ فِيهِمْ Ya Allah, I was a witness over them only as long as I was physically present in them, among them. After you took me back, كُنْتَ أَنْتَ الرَّقِيبَ عَلَيْهِمْ Only you were watching. I don't know what happened after me. This is what the Quran is presenting. But you are saying, no, no, no. Don't commit sins because the Imam is watching you. From, basically, Allah, everywhere we, where we used to use Allah previously, they are removing Allah, adding the Imam. Because they feel somehow that the people... They believe in the Imams more than they believe in Allah. And if that's the case, then that is really unfortunate. So, in any case, my dear brothers and sisters, we are only motivated by a sincere concern and a sincere feeling of sadness that has gripped us after looking at what's happening. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been replaced to the point that Ayatollah Sayyid Kamal al-Haydari, this is not uh, some scholar from other sects or something, no. Ayatollah Sayyid Kamal al-Haydari, has been a scholar who has been teaching in the Hausa of Qum for the last 35 years. He's a mujtahid, marja taqlid, he has a risala amaliya, people do his taqlid. He is saying, he narrates firsthand, he says, that someone came in my presence, he came to a marja. He said, I'll not name the marja. Because, again, in our climate, if you just narrate something like this, you say, oh, he's attacking the marja, or he's doing this, and... Allahumma musta'ana, our culture has become very, very intolerant. In any case, so much so that our, mar our maraja themselves are afraid to name names and, and mention things. He says it's not important who the marja was. The important thing is what was said to him. That one of the khutaba, one of the ahlul mimbar speakers, he comes to him, he says, I've been invited to give lectures for Shah Ramadan. Can you suggest a topic? What topic should I speak about? And this marja taqlid with a look of real genuine sadness on his face he turns to the speaker this khatib and wa'id and he says whatever you do can you please speak about allah during the month of ramadan yani a lecture or a series of lectures about allah ma'rifah of allah something about allah because allah is mazloom on our member that's it's a blasphemous expression that he used allah cannot be described as mazloom but this for lack of better words for lack of better expressions, this is the term he had to use. That yes, Allah is mazloom on the member, na'uzubillah. Why? Because he says, and he's a marjar taqlid, so obviously he knows what's going on in the community. He says, you never hear mention of Allah. Yani, by mention of Allah, I don't mean the word Allah doesn't appear on the member. No, when the khutbah will start, alhamdulillah, bismillah, all of, No, but you don't have focused lectures about Allah. How many lectures have you heard? which are specifically designed to increase your ma'rifah of Allah, to talk about the rahmah of Allah, forgiveness of Allah, 
justice of Allah. You don't have lectures about Allah. It's all about Imam, 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 Wilaya, this, that. Stories of Imams and this. And even the stories that they're telling you are most of the time khurafat. Otherwise, if you mention the genuine biography and the genuine stories of the Imams, there's no automatically you will end up doing zikr of Allah because the Imams lives are all laced with zikr of Allah. Their tongues were always wet with the zikr of Allah. That's what they used to ask Allah. That we want our tongues to be constantly engaged in your zikr. But we have replaced the zikr of Allah with zikr of Imams. And we think Imams will be happy. They will throw back the zikr on our faces, my dear. If you read their sources, you will understand these Imams who are very fierce in the matter of Allah. They would not compromise on this. They would, they would hate for them, for you to replace them with Allah. So, sorry, to replace Allah with them. They would hate for that. Nothing was more anathema to the Imams of Ahlul Bayt than this. But unfortunately... We think, no, the requirement of love is that we bypass Allah, we put Allah on the sidelines and we focus on the Imams and mention of the Imams. So this Marja Taqeed, he says, please speak about Allah because Allah is mazloom on the member, na'uzu billah. That's the term he has to use because as far as he's concerned, that is the reality, Allah. No one is interested in mention and zikr of Allah and knowing about Allah. Everyone is Imam, Imam, the Imam of the time. How do we strengthen our relationship with the Imam of the time? What about your relationship with Allah? That's on the back burner. This is what these ulama are criticizing. And no one is saying, and no one is against the zikr of Ahlul Bayt, by the way, or the zikr of other awliya and prophets of God. No, give lectures on Musa, salam, Ibrahim, salam, Ali ibn Abi Talib, salam, uh, Zain al Abidin. Salam. These are all beautiful role models. No one is saying don't talk about them. What these reformist scholars are saying is don't mention fabricated narrations about them, which project them as gods or demigods or semi-gods. No, no, no. Mention their true authentic teachings. Mention their du'as. Go deep into their literature, which is all focused on Allah. In Sahih Fasir Jadiyah, can you believe it? There is not a single mention. The Imam who went through Karbala does not even mention the name of Imam al-Hussein in this Sahih His du'a is all focused towards Allah. And Imam al-Hussein himself, if you look at the oldest maqtal, when he arrives in the battlefield of Karbala, he looks at the army of Umar ibn Sa'd. What does he do? Does he turn to Rasulullah and say, Grandfather, help me? Or Amirul Mu'mineen, that you are Mushkil Kusha, Ya Ali Madad, none of that. What does the Maqtal say? Everything is in the books. He says, Allahumma anta thiqati fi kulli karb wa rajai anda kulli shidda. He says, Ya Allah, you are the only source of confidence. When any difficulty befalls me, I derive my confidence from you and you alone. And fi kulli inda kulli shidda. Whenever I'm afflicted with calamity, with misfortune, with difficulty, with hardship, my eyes and my heart, my mind does not focus on any entity other than you. He says, Ya Allah, how many times it has happened before in my life that a hardship came in my life, a difficulty, a misfortune afflicted me. And at that time he says, the misfortune, the difficulty was so great. It's the kind of misfortune, he says, in which even your friends abandon you. Your enemies begin to rejoice and celebrate that this person, you know, he's finished. The kind of misfortune in which your enemies start rejoicing and your friends abandon you. Imam al Hussein says, I've gone through this in my life. But whenever I went through this in my life, the other thing he says is, He says, I'm talking about misfortunes and calamities. The heart becomes weak in front of them. Sometimes in your life, you are afflicted with troubles and calamities. Your heart becomes weak. You're like, I cannot take this. I cannot deal with this. Your heart becomes weak. Your morale starts to fail. It starts to uh, fail fail you. So he says, He says, I'm talking about misfortunes in which there is no strategy. You think of how will I get out of this and you cannot think of any strategy. So he's describing a high level hardship. He says, Ya Allah, I have gone through these in my life. And what would I do? He's describing his own seerah. 
What was his practice? That whenever a difficulty that was so big that his friends would abandon him, his enemies would start rejoicing, he would have no way, no strategy to come out of it. He says, what would I do? Read the maqtal. He says, anzaltuhu bik. He says, Ya Allah, whenever such a calamity would befall me, I would bring it to you. I would bring it to your court. My dear brothers and sisters, this is the way of Ahlul Bayt. He doesn't say, I would take it to my father. He's the mushkil kusha. Or I would say, Ya Ali Madad. Or I would go to Rasulullah. After he has left this world. Anzaltuhu bik. The Imams, this is their seerah. This is their sunnah. This is clear from their original teachings. And no one can deny or dispute this. They all, every scholar knows this narration. It's there in the earliest maqtal. He says, Anzaltuhu bik, Ya Allah, I would bring my problem to you. minni amman siwak. And I would turn my face away from everyone other than you. I never bring my problems, my difficulties, my issues. I would never ever bring them to anyone other than you. He says, Ya Allah, my past experiences, you always relieved me. You always came to my aid. You always assisted me. You responded to my pleas and my calls of distress. And you removed those difficulties. Difficulties which my mind was telling me, you will never come out of this. There is no way. Humanly, it is impossible. But he says, Ya Allah, you were there for me. You stepped in, you intervened, and you removed it from me. So, Ya Allah, you are the master of every na'mah. Every na'mah, every blessing and favor in my life, I attribute it to who? Not to my father, not to my grandfather, not to you. Anta waliyu kulli ni'mah wa muntaha kulli rahba. And you are the ultimate entity that I turn to for all my wishes, all my desires. I place them with you. This is the tawheed of Sayyidina Abu Abdullah al Hussein ibn Ali sallallahu wa sallam wa this is the tawheed they taught us. Not that when you are in difficulty, you turn to them. And this is why when the Quran says in Surah Al-Furqan, it's referring to pious personalities like him who are made objects of supplication and devotion and worship besides Allah. Allah will question them. These people who, who put me on the back burner and they made you the object of all their devotion. Did you misguide them? Did you tell them to make you the object of your of their supplication and worship? Remember, supplication in the language of the Quran is, is a form of worship. The Prophet and Imam al-Baqir numerous narrations confirm this. Ad-du'a umukhul ibadah. Famous hadith of Ahlul Bayt, which no one denies. That du'a is the brain and the essence of worship. So if you are doing du'a to someone across the curtain of Ghayb Yani, this is worship, it is ibadah. So that's why Allah is asking that this ibadah has been done. It was supposed to be done to me, but people have done it to you. They used to call upon you. Did you teach them this? In Surah Al-Furqan, read verses 16, 17, 18. Allah does not mention any entities by name. He is just mentioning that there are some entities that I will question on the Day of Judgment. Did you teach these people? Did you misguide these people? Because they got misguided. We want to determine and ascertain here whether you are responsible for them or they're amhum sabil or did they go astray themselves? You had nothing nothing to do with this. And these pious entities who are made objects of supplication and devotion and worship besides Allah, you know what they respond? They say, Qalu Subhanaka. Say Allah, glory be to you. Ma kana yambaghi lana an nattakhila min dunika min awliya. It did not befit us that we should take any entity besides you as our guardian and our protector. So Imam al Hussein can easily say, Ya Allah, the maqtal is there. Look at my dua in Karbala when I was surrounded by enemies. Look at the dua that I made. I tested, I gave you the whole summary of my life. Whenever I was afflicted with trouble, with hardship, even in Karbala, what am I doing? Am I turning to other than Allah or am I asking Allah? So this is the question and, and that's why, you know, if, you, if no mantiq, no logic, no argument convinces you, then at least... Be convinced by the, the argument of Imam Sadiq which he gave to the, the atheist Ibn Abil Awja. He says, look, if there are two possibilities. One is Imam Sadiq says we are correct. There is a God and you are a liar in claiming that there is no God. And the other possibility is we are wrong and you are right. You are right in your claim that there is no God 
and we are wrong in our claim that there is a God. This is, let's consider, let's delve deep into these two possibilities. If your, if we take the possibility that there is no God, if let's say this possibility turns out to be true, then we will both end up in the same place. If there is no God, there is no Hisab, there is no Day of Judgment, then you, the atheist, will die and get your bones are going to turn into dust and you will go into nothingness and my bones will also turn into dust after I die and we will turn into nothingness and that's the end of it. What will happen to you will happen to me, so I'm not at a loss. But if I am right, and I am right, I'm telling you I am right, Imam Salih tells him, then I thought I will get my najat because I believed in Allah, I believed in the last and final day of judgment and I worked for it. So Allah is going to save me from his punishment because I worked for it and I believed in him. You on the other hand, if I turn out to be right and there is a possibility, great possibility that I'm right, in fact I am right, then you my dear, you will end up where? In Jahannam. So mine is a win-win situation, yours is a lose-lose situation. Same thing applies here my dear brothers and sisters. If no argument, the reformist scholars, alhamdulillah, there's an entire encyclopedia that we have compiled of researches reformist researchers that shows you why you should not pray to anyone or supplicate to any entity other than Allah. It is foolishness, it is against the teaching of Islam, it is against the teaching of Ahlul Bayt and the Prophet and the Quran, presented clear evidences. But even if those evidences don't convince you, adopt the safer path, the path that Imam Salih is saying. See, if we are wrong and it is the fact is that, for example, it is permissible to supplicate, Allah has given the Ahlul Bayt this power. We are not going to get into trouble on the Day of Judgment. Why? Because we'll say, Allah, in our life, we followed your, your verse of the Quran in which you said, Ud'uni. You have not forbidden us from calling upon you, right? In fact, you encouraged us. You said, Ud'uni, astajib lakum. So call upon me and I'll answer you. And then we have so many du'as from the Ahlul Bayt in which they are only calling upon you and not calling upon any other entity. So if we follow this verse of the Quran plus the example of those du'as that had come to us from the Ahlul Bayt, then how can you punish us for following what the Quran is saying and what also the Ahlul Bayt practically demonstrated? So many of these du'as that exist in the literature of Ahlul Bayt, du'a al-Mashlul, du'a Kumail, uh, du'a, the du'as of Sahih al-Sajjadiya, du'a Abi Hamza Thumali, all these du'as are addressed exclusively to Allah. There is no mention of Imam addressing anyone other than Allah. So Ya Allah, this is an entire du'a by an authorized Imam of Ahlul Bayt. And we, our entire life, we prayed to you the way these Imams prayed to you. That's the only uh, version that our research was able to authenticate. So that's why we only prayed to you. You think Allah will send us to Jahannam for that? No. So we are safe. Even if it turns out that it is permissible to supplicate to the Ahlul Bayt, but we did not supplicate to them, then we are still safe. Right? But if it turns out that supplicating to the Ahlul Bayt is ibadah as Allah calls it in the Quran as Imam Baqar confirms as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa confirms if it is really ibadah and it is ibadah then we of course we never prayed to the Ahlul Bayt we never supplicated to them so we are safe but you on the other hand you the one who ventured to supplicate to them and pray to them and you will be in big trouble because Allah can tell you that I gave you explicit instructions in the Quran wala tad'u min dunillah don't call upon entities other than Allah. وَأَنَّ الْمَسَاجِدَ لِلَّهِ فَلَا تَدْعُوا مَعَ اللَّهِ أَحَدًا Not only does Allah say don't call upon entities other than Allah. Allah also tells you don't call upon any entities together with Allah. Which is what you do when you recite Ilahi Azm al-Bala. You start by calling upon Allah. Ilahi is Allah. My Lord. And then slowly, slowly, you're calling upon Allah and you're saying وَأَنْتَ الْمُسْتَعَانِ you are the one whom we seek help from. You are the one that we rely on in difficulty and in ease. And then slowly, slowly you slide and then the interpolation of the ghulat comes. Ya Ali, Ya Muhammad, ikfiyani fa'innakuma kafiyan, wansurani fa'innakuma nasuran. And you are reciting this word in the masjid where Allah told you, وَأَنَّ الْمَسَاجِدَ لِلَّهِ فَلَا تَدْعُوا مَعَ اللَّهِ أَحَدَ these places of prostration, they are for Allah. Therefore, do not call together with Allah anyone else. So Allah is forbidding you. He's saying, if you're calling upon making dua to me, don't call anyone else together with me. Because if you're calling someone else together that, with me, you've set up an equal with me. And it doesn't matter if that, that equal happens to be a slave of mine who is praiseworthy. doesn't matter. 
Isa alayhi salam is very praiseworthy. Yet on the day of judgment, he will be questioned by Allah. Did you teach these people that they should take you as the Lord and guardian and savior and protector besides Allah? Say Allah, I do not have anything to do with this. Same thing with Imams. Their hujjah against you is complete. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam can point out to this dua. If you're calling Abu al Fadl al Abbas, he can say, My master, Abba Abdullah al Hussein, you didn't read his dua in the maqtal. He, you, his role model was not in front of you. This dua did not reach you. Where Imam is teaching you that, Ya Allah, my policy, my way of life is that whenever I have a difficulty, I turn my face away from all entities other than you and I present my problem only and only before you. So this, this role model was not in front of you. Then why did you ignore it? Why did you sideline it and go for approaches for which you had no support, no backing from the Quran, no backing from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, from his established authentic sunnah, no backing from the authentic original teachings of Ahlul Bayt alayhi wa sallam, alayhi wa sallam. And if you were confused, then why did you opt for a path that major scholars had warned you against? This is not something, it's not an issue of saying, oh, there are just some bachas or some kids. Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Hussein Fadlullah is not a bacha. Okay, he's not a kid. He, is, he was the pride of the house of Najaf. I repeatedly mentioned this. Ayatollah Sayyid Shaheed Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr said about him that كل من ترك النجف خاسر النجف إلا Sayyid Muhammad Hussein Fadlullah فإن النجف قد خاسره Everyone who leaves the house of Najaf, it is his loss. Because Najaf is the city of knowledge. It is the headquarters of the Marja'iyya. This is where all the aim and knowledge and research is. Everyone who leaves Najaf, it is his loss. Except for one person, Sayyid Muhammad Hussein, Fadlullah. Because when he left Najaf, it was Najaf's loss. It was not his loss. It was our loss. Because when he left Najaf and went to Lebanon for Tabliq, we were deprived of his, of his uh, beneficial presence. So this is not a kid we are talking about. This is a high level scholar and he, the video is there on YouTube. For those of you who want to go and see openly, he's addressing in the public and he says this practice that you have developed of saying, Ya Ali, Ya Muhammad, calling upon them, making dua to them. This is ghulu. This is ghulu. They never taught you. They never promoted this. The Ahlul Bayt never promoted this. So it's not like the hujjah against you is not complete. There are major scholars who have warned you against this. Those who are not speaking out against this, they'll have to give their own hisab. Ultimately, whether the scholars speak out against something, they don't speak about something, that does not exonerate you. That does not absolve you of responsibility. Allah has given you the kitab, He's given you the Quran, He's given you aql, He's given you the role model and established teachings of Ahlul Bayt. After that, the scholars say, they don't say, if they say it's an added bonus, but you don't need them to say it until for you to recognize that this is wrong. This is self-evident. This is obvious to anyone who has read the Quran. And this is the biggest weakness in our communities. We're not connected to the Quran. We're disconnected from the Quran, my dear brothers and sisters. Otherwise, these issues would not even be debated. We wouldn't have to speak for so long and rant and rave about these things. If we were connected to the Quran, the Quran's worldview is 100% Allah-focused. In the worldview of the Quran, the slaves of Allah are just there to warn you, give you the message. In alayka illa al-balaq, your only task, O Rasulullah, is to deliver the message. That's it. They deliver their message, their role is, their responsibility is completed. It's up to you whether you want to accept their message or not. But everything else, wallahu ala kulli shayin wakil. As Allah tells in Surah Hud, He tells the Prophet, in anta illa nazir, you're just a warner, nothing more. Wallahu ala kulli shayin wakil. It is Allah who is the controller of everything. You're just a plain warner. So in any case, my dear brothers and sisters, we need to wake up. We need to read the Quran. We need to read the authentic sunnah and sirah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. And if you are going to argue, as I mentioned in some of the previous lectures, some people said, no, well, the reformist scholars like Atullah Fadlullah so many of us, some of the other scholars have discredited them. They have spoken out against them. If they have spoken out against them, then you show me one scholar against whom no one has spoken out against. Even Ayatollah Sayyid Ali Sistani has people who have uh, scholars, students of Sayyid Al-Khui who have declared him incompetent and 
unworthy of taqlid. So what are you going to do? You're going to stop. You're going to say Atullah Sistani is no longer learned now because Atullah Sheikh Ali al gharawi has a written fatwa signed and stamped by his office that he gave against Atullah Sistani. Just because of that, you're going to say that no, Atullah Sistani now has no value. Is that the approach you're going to follow? Or you're going to say no? We have to look at, we can't just go by what the scholars say about each other. Okay, because as Al-Allama Sayyid Abdullah al ghurayfi when he was asked about Ayatollah Fadullah, one of the muqalladeen that, you know, so many people are spreading so much, you know, they're casting so many aspersions on Sayyid Fadullah, they're saying so many bad things about him. So can we really take his researches seriously? Because he has been discredited by some, by Ayatollah, for example, Sheikh Jawad Tabrizi, who is a student of Sayyidul Khuy. So Al-Allama Sayyid Abdullah al ghurayfi his response is beautiful. He says, لا يضر وجود من يخالف. He says the stature of Sayyid Muhammad Sayyid Fadlullah is such that the fact that he has mukhalifin, he has people who oppose him and discredit him, does not affect him in the least. Because he says, وَإِلَّا فَلَمْ تَجِدَ فَقِيهًا مَوْضِعَ اتِّفَاقِ Because if you're going to go by the principle that no, I'm only going to follow a marja or I'm only going to listen to the research of a scholar who has not been discredited by anyone, Al-Allama Sayyid Abdullah al ghurayfi he says, guess what? You will not be able to benefit from the research of any scholar in the Shia world. لَن تَجِدَ فَقِيهًا مَوْضِعَ اتِّفَاقِ Because there is not a single scholar who has not been attacked or discredited or criticized by some other scholar. Ya Allah, so what are you going to do now? And the best example is the, the marja who is believed to be A'lam today. Ayatollah Sayyid Ali al-Sistani is written fatwa we have. By Ayatollah Sheikh Ali al gharawi the top student of Ayatollah Sayyid Abdul Qasim al-Khui Sayyid Abdul Qasim al khui was so proud of Ayatollah Sheikh Ali al-Gharawi that it is said, he used to say that I, sometimes I feel like I've wasted my time in the house of Najaf Ayatollah Khui used to say but then when I look at Ayatollah Sheikh Ali al-Gharawi that is when I realize that no, maybe I've not wasted my time if I'm able to produce one student like Ayatollah Sheikh Ali al-Gharawi that is a big achievement for me so this is the, this is the level of the scholar who has Try to discredit Sayyid Sistani. So obviously we are not uh, we're not supporting him in this. No, all I'm saying, I'm giving you this example to prove a specific point, which is that if you're just going to dismiss all the great research that a scholar has done, just because one scholar spoke out against him or two scholars spoke out against him or a team of scholars spoke, spoke out against him, then my friend, you cannot follow any scholar in the Muslim world. Not just in the Shia community, in the Muslim Ummah you will not find us. Scholars have their differences. Sometimes those differences, they metamorphose into enmity and hatred and animosity and antagonism. Yeah, it happens. So don't have this childish approach that, oh, so-and-so scholar has been discredited. So, well, guess what? When it comes to enmity and hatred, there are no objective criteria for that. Imam al-Sadiq as I shared in the past lectures, because of the filth that the Ghulat attributed to him, some scholars ended up discrediting Na'udhu Billah, Imam al-Sadiq They labeled him as Da'if al-Hadith wal Ayyadu Billah. That Imam al-Sadiq Na'udhu Billah is Da'if, he's weak in Hadith, Na'udhu Billah. Why? Because Bichara, they didn't have insight into the knowledge of Imam al-Sadiq, they just saw the Ahadith being transmitted from him. And the Ghulat, obviously, they have attributed all kinds of nonsense to him. So they see these nonsensical narrations which go against the Quran and the Sunnah and against common sense. And who is at the top? Qala Sadiq. Qala Abu Abdullah Sadiq. So they said, okay, if Abu Abdullah Sadiq is preaching and promoting these kinds of nonsense, then he must be Ba'if al Hadith. We have to label him as someone whose hadith cannot be relied upon, unfortunately. So just because some ulama discredited Imam al Sadiq out of their ignorance, you're going to say, oh, I can't follow Imam Sadiq now because. You know, some ulama have discredited him. What kind of mantra is this? Imam Ali al Islam gave you the best solution. He said, Look, la tanzur ila man qal, unzur ila ma qal. Don't look at what, who said it. Look at what is being said. I'arif al haqqa, I'arif al rijala bil haqq, wa la ta'arif al haqqa bil rijal. Recognize the truth first and then judge the people by it, not the other way around. That you identify certain people and say, you know what, these people are the truth and then you just close your eyes and everything they say is truth and everyone who opposes them is false. So this is not an academic objective approach. This is not the approach that the Imams of Al-Bayt taught us.
So in any case, my dear brothers and sisters, at the end of the day, when you are part of a sectarian establishment, unfortunately, you end up defending the indefensible and you end up having to support a lot of the things that are being promoted within the sect which are actually not correct and so yes because of that it is not uh, altogether surprising to see sometimes ulama unfortunately even ulama and scholars they end up promoting a lot of the things that are not established by research but they do that because they are part of an establishment and they have to defend it at all costs but you the individual you the member of the public you are free. You don't need to necessarily tie yourself to any particular uh, scholar or any particular position. You are free to research. Allah has given you tools, He's given you resources, He's given you the Quran, the intellect, common sense. Apply all of these gifts. He's not given you these gifts so that you should outsource them to others and say, you know what, this so and so scholar will read the Quran for me, he will use the apple for me, and then he'll give me ready made material on a plate, and I'll just close my eyes and eat it. You might end up eating poison if you do that. And unfortunately, most people are who are misguided, they are misguided and deviant because of this approach. This approach, mashallah, is very popular in the world. So many people who are misguided just because they have closed their eyes, they're not willing to consider and critically evaluate the evidences and the proofs behind the claims that they are accepting. They just want to outsource their critical thinking to someone else. Don't make that mistake. This is the reason why the Quran condemns these people then and says, nasi, nasi la Majority of people, they don't use the aql that Allah has given them. Allah has not given you these gifts of the Quran and the role model of the Ahlul Bayt and this beautiful intellect so that you should suspend it and throw it into someone else's court and say, you know what? Let them use these gifts. I will outsource this to someone else let them do the hard work and then tell me what I should believe in. And that's why even we tell our students and those who follow these lectures, we are as fallible as any other person on the street. Don't accept anything because we are saying it. Do not go by our statements. Do not go by our... We are not hujja. We don't have any hujja. What I tell you is only as good and as solid as the evidence on which what I'm telling you is based. So whenever you hear me speaking, whenever you hear me presenting any research, look at the arguments, look at the evidence, evaluate it, assess it, analyze it. And if the evidence, the hujja is strong and convincing, and it is backed by what Allah has revealed in the Quran, it is backed by the practice of the Ahlul Bayt, accept it. And if it is not, throw it back. Throw it back on my very face. Never ever accept anything. Unless, because ultimately neither I nor any other researcher, scholar, speaker, no one is going to save you on the Day of Judgment. وَمَا لَكُم مِّن دُونِ اللَّهِ مِنْ وَلِيٍّ وَلَا نَصِيرٍ As Allah repeatedly reminds us in the Quran, He says, you don't have any friend, any protector, any guardian who is going to help you on the Day of Judgment. You are going to be on your own. And that's why, my dear brothers and sisters, the, the aim of the, this series and all this work that we're doing, we're trying to remind people, first of all, to strengthen their connection with the Quran. Because all the deviation, all the misguidance that we see is because the connection with the Qur'an is loose. People are not connected and intimately familiar with the Qur'an. Otherwise, all these khurafat would disappear. As Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad said, Fallallahu, when he was asked, what is your dalil against wilayat taqwiniya This claim that you know the Imams are controlling the whole universe with Allah's permission. And that Allah has given them all these powers. He said, أَتَصَوَّرْ أَنَّ الْقُرْآنِ الْكَرِيمِ كُلُّهُ كُلَّهُ دَلِيلٌ عَلَىٰ عَدَمِ الْوِلَىٰةِ تَقْوِنِيَ so the whole Quran is proof against this. So where do you see in the Quran Allah promoting the idea that anyone else has these powers other than him? And the examples that they give, the Prophet Isa Islam is able to raise the dead and he's able to inform people of what they're eating. And he said, Baba, these are miracles. And these miracles, Allah can allow these miracles to happen. But just because Allah allowed it for Isa Islam, does not give you the right to say that, okay, he must have also allowed it for Musa Islam. Every prophet, all the different prophets were given different miracles. And if you are claiming that a certain prophet was given a miracle that a previous prophet was given, then you have to show evidence for that. You can't just assume and extrapolate and say, well, if one prophet was given this, therefore all prophets have to be given this. No, because we have proof that this is false. 
Allah created Isa alayhi salam without father, without male intervention. Does this, this is also a mir miracle. And it was with the permission of Allah that this happened. So does this give me the right to say then that, okay, Rasulullah was also born without a father. This Abdullah, Janabi Abdullah is a fictitious character. He does not exist. And okay, what's your dalil? So my dalil is Isa alayhi salam. If Allah did this mu'jiza with Isa, why not with the Holy Prophet? Is the Holy Prophet, na'udhu billah, inferior? Say, no, my dear, it is not a question of inferiority, superiority. It's a question of Allah testifying. For Isa alayhi salam, Allah testifies. That inna mathala Isa inna Allah ka mathali Adam khalaqahu min turadun thumma qala lahu kun fayakun. That the example of Isa is like that of Adam. So Allah testified in his case. He gave us information in the Quran on the basis of, basis of which we know that he was born without a father. Qalat anna yakunu li ghulamu wa lam yamsasni bashar. How can I have a son when no human being, when no male has touched me? So Allah has given you the, that information in the Quran for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Where in the Quran is Allah said that I also created him without a father? So no, Allah doesn't have to say. If he said it for Isa, it's enough for us to extrapolate on that basis that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or the Imams of Ahlul Bayt were also born without male intervention. No, this is, this is illogical logic. Okay, this is bo baseless, bogus logic. This is not the way you can't extrapolate claims about ghaib from past events of ghaib. Just because Allah gave certain supernatural miracles to a certain prophet is no guarantee that he will give it to the other prophet. So if you want to claim that the other prophet has also been given those miracles, you have to bring evidence. And the evidence is not there. In fact, the opposite is there. In the Quran, Allah denies giving the Holy Prophet supernatural, visually supernatural miracles. So he gives him the Quran, but the Quran is not a visual miracle. It's an auditory. The Quran used to be recited. And the miracle of the Quran is in listening to its recitation. When you listen to its recitation, its language, that is miraculous. It's not a visual miracle. Yani when you see the Quran, the mu'jizah is not in, in the text of the Quran. The text of the Quran is like any. You open any Arabic book and you open the Arabic text of the Quran, it's not a big difference. There's nothing miraculous. Both are Arabic alphabets, right? So the text of the Quran the eye, does not appeal to the eyes. Its miracle, the miracle of the Quran, is not a visual miracle in the sense that it does not appeal to the eyes. It appeals to the intellect and to the ears. But the mu'jizat of the previous prophets appeal to the eyes. The kuffar and mushrikeen wanted a miracle that would appeal to the eyes. They insisted on it. But Allah tells them in verse 58 of chapter 17, Surah Al-Isra, He says, وَمَا مَنَعَنَا أَن نُرْسِلَ بِالْآيَاتِ إِلَّا أَن كَذَّبَ بِهَا الْأَوَّلُونَ Nothing has prevented us from sending these miraculous signs that they are demanding, except for the fact that previous communities and nations denied them. So basically Allah is saying every time we sent a mu'jizah, the people denied it, they falsified it, they did not accept it. So that's why we have decided we are no longer going to provide visual mu'jizah. We'll provide you the Quran, which is an intellectual mu'jizah. It will appeal to the intellect. If you want to accept it, فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ Whoever wants to believe it should believe in it. Whoever wants to disbelieve in it may disbelieve in it, but there will be consequences. إِنَّا أَعْتَدْنَا لِلظَّالِمِينَ نَارًا أَحَاطَ بِهِمْ سُرَادِقُهَا For those who are guilty of the zulm of rejecting the revelations of Allah which are in the Qur'an, Allah promises them the fire of hell. So, my point is, my dear brothers and sisters, you cannot extrapolate things like this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Musa alayhi salam, his staff could convert into a snake. He could split the whole sea with that staff, with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Holy Prophet also had a staff. Am I permitted to say that, well, because Musa, with Allah's permission, could convert the staff into a snake, therefore Rasulullah also did the same thing. Rasulullah also brought his staff and he put it in front of the people of Mecca and it converted into a snake. If I narrate this from the member, the ulama of Rijal and Hadith and history are going to eat me up. So this is you are a liar. So why? Why am I a liar? If Allah could do it for Musa, he can't do it for Rasulullah. Well, say, Baba, no one is denying imkana. We are not debating possibility. Yes, it is entirely possible. If Allah wanted, he could have converted Rasulullah's staff or his stick into a snake. But the question is, just because Allah can do something doesn't mean he has done it. You have to bring proof that he has done it. 
And when we turn to the seerah of the Prophet, there is not a single report or event or narration where we are told that Rasulullah ever, his staff or his stick ever converted into a snake. So in the absence of such a narration, authentic narration, you have no grounds for claiming that he was given this marjiza. It's not his marjiza, it's the marjiza of Musa alayhi salam, you can attribute it to him. Because for that you have backing in the Quran. But marjiza for which Allah has not attributed the Holy Prophet. You cannot come on your own using your intellectual, logical extrapolations. You cannot attribute it to Rasulullah. It's as simple as that. And as far as Rasulullah and the Imams are concerned, their real, what they presented to the world was the knowledge of the Quran. That is what proved their claim to what they were claiming. So Rasulullah, Rasulullah's claim to prophethood is established by the Quran, by the miraculous nature of the Quran, not by any other miracle. And this is clear from the Quran itself. So in any case, my dear brothers and sisters, it is unfortunate that in our communities, we have deviated from the vision of Ahlul Bayt in many areas. And that is why there is need for reform. And don't wait. Don't wait. You know, many scholars, many members of the public say, well, when the scholars collectively come and they speak out against this, then we're going to abandon these practices. Don't wait for that. That would take a very long time. Eventually, inshallah, it will happen. You will see. But it, it may take a very long time. It's just like belief in Tahrif al-Quran. In the Safawid period of Shiaism, some of the top scholars of Shia Islam were promoting the belief in Tahrif al-Quran, like Allama al-Majlisi, Muhaddith al-Nuri, these top Akhbari scholars who were representatives of the Shia scholarly establishment of the time. They were notoriously and openly promoting the concept of, the, of Tahrif, that the Quran is not the same Quran which Jibreel brought to the Holy Prophet. And yes, there were people who opposed it, but their voices were suppressed. They were marginalized. And it took centuries before the ulama could get their act together and collectively bury and suppress this belief and, and dismiss it as a nonsensical claim of the ghulat. But my question is, all the people who died in the intervening period, their hujjah would be the same to say, Allah, the ulama, the biggest ulama were speaking in favor of this. Allama Majlisi was in favor of this. Muhaddis al Nuri wrote a whole book. Faslul Khitab fi Ithbati Tahrifi Kitabi Rabbil Arbab. This is his book that he wrote to prove that this Quran has been changed. It is not the same Quran that Allah revealed on the Holy Prophet. So these people, the people who lived in this period, the Shia Bichara, who trusted these scholars and ended up believing in this completely fabricated Ghali concept, what hujjah do you think they have on the, on the Day of Judgment? Do you think Allah will let them get away by saying, well, so the top scholars will... You know, they told us this. So Allah will say, the top scholars, you listen to the top scholars. Why didn't you listen to me when I told you clearly in verse 9 of Surah 15? Inna we reveal this reminder, we will protect it. So Allah says, I told you I'll protect it. These scholars told you that, no, I lied. I did not protect it. You know, more than two thirds of it evaporated and I did nothing about it. So when it came to me versus them, you trusted the scholars. This is basically what Allah condemns the Jews and Christians for. They've taken their rabbis, their doctors of law, their jurists, and their spiritual leaders as lords besides Allah. Because Allah was saying something in the scripture, their scholars were saying the opposite, they followed what the scholars said, they abandoned the scripture. And unfortunately in Hulu, this is also what's happening, is that people are more concerned about what the scholars are saying. What is the book saying? What is the Quran saying? Did you ever attempt to sincerely read this Quran? After removing the sectarian prisms, just read the translation. If you go into the commentaries, in the commentaries, every sectarian scholar will try to defend his preconceived sectarian beliefs. Read the translation first and then judge the commentary with the translation. So in any case, my dear brothers and sisters, it is our sincere prayer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give all of us the tawfiq to do something about this. Ultimately, even if no one listens to us. We are still successful as long as we deliver the message. Our job is not to convince people. Allah will not question us. He tells his Prophet that Inna arsalnaka bil wa nadhiram, wa la tus'alu an ashabil jahim. 
we have sent you <clears throat> as a bringer of glad tidings and as a warner, and you shall not be questioned about the people of the fire of hell. Yani the one who denies your message and goes to hell, you are not responsible for him. So if Rasulullah is not responsible, then all those whom he has entrusted with the job of Amr bil Ma'ruf and Nahi al-Munkar, and that is the entire Ummah, by the way, not just the scholars. But in any case, whenever you have the job of Amr bil Ma'ruf and Nahi al-Munkar, Allah has made your task easy. You don't have to convince anyone. And we don't intend to convince or persuade. That's not our job. Our job is to present the evidence. We are trying to present the evidence and the warning. To tell the people that, look, so that on the day of judgment, you don't come and catch my neck and say, you know what, Sayyidina, you knew all of this stuff. You had seen all these researches. You had read the advanced writing, advanced level writings of Hawza scholars, Mujtahidi, Maraji. So many of these great scholars who have admitted all of this that's going wrong. You know, you had read a high level, massively well credentialed scholar like Ayatollah Sheikh Abdullah Mamkani, for example, the teacher of Ayatollah Sayyid Shahabuddin al marashi Najafi, saying in his book repeatedly that, yes, we have come a long way from the time of the Imams and from the teaching and manhaj and methodology of the Imams. So much so that majority of the beliefs أَكْثَرْ مَنْ أَعْتَقِدُهُ الْيَوْمْ مِنْ ضَرُورِيَّاتِ الْمَذْهَبْ فِي أَوْصَافِ الْأَيْمَّةِ عَلَيْهِمُ السَّلَامِ كَانَ الْقَوْلُ بِهِ مَعْدُودًا فِي الْغُلُوبِ فِي الْعَهْدِ السَّابِقَ That majority of what Ayatollah Mamqani says we believe today, the Shia is what, what, what they believe today about the Imams, the Imamology the supernatural attributes, qualities, Allah's sifat being transferred to the Imams, all of these things in the past, during the time of the Imams, in the time of the classical scholars, this was considered to be ghulu. When, when we, so Ayatollah, I'm not the one saying this, Ayatollah Mamqani, traditional scholar is saying this. I'm just presenting his evidence. And you can't say, you can call me a kid if you want to, but you can't call Ayatollah Mamqani. He's the teacher of Ayatollah Marashi Najafi, whom these speakers are praising and saying he's such a high level scholar. Well, his teacher is saying that majority of your beliefs about Imams today, particularly their attributes and qualities, their supernatural qualities, otherwise their human qualities, such as the fact that they were the most learned human beings after Rasulullah, such as the fact that their akhlaq was the best after Rasulullah, this no one is disputing. This the whole ummah accepts, except those who are blind. So what is in dispute, what the reformist scholars are rejecting, and denying are the supernatural attributes that you've given them. And you're thinking that giving them is these supernatural divine attributes is elevating their station. Just as the Christians, they sincerely and honestly think that when they believe Jesus is the son of God, like, you know, you're raising his status. No, you're not. Lies do not raise the status of a slave of God. They demote his status and they create problems for that slave. Because on the day of judgment, then he has to respond and he has to answer the questions of Allah on the day of judgment. That, well, did you promote this? And then he has to set the record straight and say, no, I did not promote this. This is stuff that these people invented on their own. So that is why, my dear brothers and sisters, our job is to convey, it is to warn, so that on the day of judgment, you don't grab my neck and say, well, Sayyidina, you knew all of this. You had read these admissions and these rare confessions by these top scholars, which they make in their advanced level writings. But, and you were a prominent lecturer among us, you used to give lectures, you used to talk about this and that, and, you know, there was a cancer growing in our midst and you never even addressed it, you never talked about it, you never warned us against it. Well, I've done my job. I, my only duty and my responsibility is not to convince anyone, not to persuade anyone. You reject all these researches. Fit dunya and akhirah. If that does not affect me in any way, I don't have any agenda, I don't stand to lose. You can go ahead. Go as deep as you want to go in ghulu. Ultimately, as Allah tells me, He assures me in the Quran, Ya ladina amanu alaykum anfusakum. O you who believe, worry about yourself. La yadurrukum man dalla idha tadaytum. The one who goes astray, his going astray is not going to harm you in the least if you hold on to the rope of guidance. Alhamdulillah, with the tawfir that Allah has given us, we have. Did we are determined to hold fast to the rope of Allah, that is the Quran, and the other heavy weight entity that the Prophet left behind, which is the Ahlul Bayt, their true teachings, which always agree with the Quran. So we have we are holding on to that rope, and no matter what happens, we inshallah with the, we pray to Allah to give us tawfiq to never let go of this of this rope, this urwatul wuthqa lam laha. The rope of Allah, which is the Quran, and the pious role model of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and these pure and noble Imams of Ahlul Bayt, 
we have, alhamdulillah, aligned ourselves. We were also born in a very corrupt environment. We were born inside the sectarian establishment. But we have realigned ourselves with the guidance that our research led us to conclude is the ultimate guidance which has come to, come to us from the Quran and, and the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt. So we have done that. And the next responsibility after we have realigned ourselves is Amr bil ma'roof, nahir munkar, wa tawasaw bil haq, wa tawasaw bil sabr. You have to preach and promote the truth. People are saying, don't promote the truth, don't preach the truth because it will create fitna. And they said that the same thing to Rasulullah. The Kuffar and Mushrikeen, they said this, this message of Tawheed you have brought, it is splitting the community. The Kuffar and Mushrikeen of Makkah, this is what they used to say about Rasulullah. You're turning father against son and son against father. And in the battles of Badr and Uhud, you had cases where the father is Mushrik, son is Mu'min, they fight. And Amir al Mu'minin proudly states this in Najib al During the time of the Prophet, the companions, they used to fight their own brothers and fathers and sons. So yes, when the Haq comes, Haq has the potential to divide. Especially when it comes in a community that is immersed in Batil, there is going to be division. But we don't have a choice. If we don't share the Haq, if we don't share the truth, then what will we answer Allah on the Day of Judgment? If you can pledge and promise to defend me in the court of Allah on the Day of Judgment, and Allah questions me and says, okay, the rest of the scholars will deal with them afterwards. You, you knew too much. You knew stuff. You knew, you had done research. You knew the whole Quran by heart. You had memorized the Torah and the encyclopedia of teachings that has come from the Ahlul Bayt. What were you doing? And you had a mouth, you had a microphone. How come you were so silent about this? What am I going to respond? So ultimately, my real motivation in all of this is to clear myself of blame. Whether people accept, they label me, they, I've given them permission, license, curse me, abuse me, do whatever. Doesn't make any difference to me. Because ultimately, my goal is what? I know I cannot convert or convince or change anyone. This is a matter of free will. The arguments, the logic, the dalil from Quran and Hadith convinces you, you'll accept the truth. Doesn't convince you, you reject it. I cannot force you to do anything. And I don't want to force anyone. I don't want to impose or push this research on anyone. I'm not imposing it on anyone. My job is just to present. After I have presented this, I am, inshallah ta'ala, it is my hope that I'm clear of blame in the sight of Allah. And then on the day of judgment, neither can Allah question me or accuse me or nor can anyone else say that, Ya Allah, you know, if people who knew this stuff, they didn't tell us, they didn't warn us. The hujjah, your hujjah is not complete on us because we had no one who came and told us, how do you expect us, the lay people, we have not read the advanced level writings, we have not studied all of these things. And... Day and night, 24-7, 365 days a week, the mimbar and the microphone was blasting these ghali concepts on us. So what do you expect us? So well, we have done our little bit. We don't have a very extensive platform. We don't have, uh, we're not able to reach out as many people as ideally we would want to reach out to. But at least we're, we're you know, we're doing something. And we hope, it is our sincere hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts these efforts. And that he, that we do not get into trouble on the day of judgment. That is our biggest goal, to clear ourselves of blame in the court of Allah on the day of judgment for not sharing these crucial evidences that were vital and very necessary and crucial in bringing people back to the actual religion of Islam from which they had deviated. So once we have done, once we are done delivering the message, our job is done. No, it's up to you. You accept it, you don't accept it. Personally, it does not make any difference to me. I would pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I see a lot of potential in our community, especially our youths, mashallah. They are wonderful people. I have great love for them, especially our Khoja communities and our communities in general around the world, mashallah. There's a lot of potential and we could really have been the leaders of the Ummah in terms of the literary wisdom and heritage and treasure that has come down to us from the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. We are uniquely placed to solve the problems that this Ummah is suffering from. Because the spiritual guidance and wisdom that we have received, no one else has received. But unfortunately, we replaced all of that with these Qurafahs and nonsensical beliefs, and that's why this community is now becoming the laughing stock of the Muslim Ummah. No one in the Muslim Ummah takes it seriously. People, whenever they hear this name, the name of this community, they are like, okay, these are people of shirk and bid'ah, and 
glorifying, worshipping imams, all of these negative concepts because of the, and the community and the leadership is at fault. You have not done enough to combat these false concepts that have been promoted and spread in the name of love for imams. So naturally, this is what the people are going to do. What we need to do is set the record straight, at least clear the name of, names of our imams, set the record straight and tell the world that, look, even if people are believing in this, this is, our imams are not responsible for this. Our imams were Allah-focused people. They were fully and fiercely devoted to Allah. And they never promoted themselves at the expense of Allah. They never promoted their own remembrance at the expense of the zikr and remembrance of Allah. And they were not about themselves. They were all about Allah. And they gave their lives for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they were exactly as Allah describes his people in verses 78 and 79 of Surah al Imran, chapter 3, with which I will end this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَا كَانَ لِبَشَرٍ أَنْ يُؤْتِيَهُ اللَّهُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحُكْمَ وَالنُّبُوَّةَ ثُمَّ يَقُولَ لِلنَّاسِ كُونُوا عِبَادًا لِي مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ وَلَكِنْ كُونُوا رَبَّانِيِّينَ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تُعَلِّمُونَ الْكِتَابَ وَبِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَدْرُسُونَ وَلَا يَأْمُرَكُمْ أَنْ تَتَّخِذُوا الْمَلَائِكَةَ وَالنَّبِيِّينَ أَرْبَابًا أَيَأْمُرُكُمْ بِالْكُفْرِ بَعْدَ إِذْ أَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says مَا كَانَ لِبَشَرٍ It is absolutely impossible, inconceivable for a human being that I should give him أَنْ يُؤْتِيَهُ اللَّهُ الْكِتَابَ That Allah should give him the book وَالْحِكْمَةَ أَنْ يُؤْتِيَهُ اللَّهُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةَ That Allah should give him the book Sorry, that Allah should give him the book and al-hukmah wa nubuwwat He should give him authority and he should give him the nubuwwah. And then he should go around telling people that kunu ibadan li min dunillah. That you should devote yourselves to me instead of Allah. Make me the focus of your devotion and your slavery. You know, this complex, this phenomenon that we see in our communities, that we want to become slaves of imams, you know. We address the Imams in the Ziyarat and we beg them and we lower ourselves and humble ourselves before them. The Quran teaches you, no, don't do this to anyone other than Allah. You are not a slave of anyone except Allah. The Imams, the Prophets, the Awliya, these are role models. These are guides who will connect you and show you how to be good slaves to Allah. But you're not supposed to direct your slavery to them. That's what Allah is telling you in verse 78 of chapter 3. He's saying, مَا كَانَ لِبَشَرٍ أَنْ يُؤْتِيَهُ اللَّهُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحُكْمَ وَالْنُبُوَّةَ ثُمَّ يَقُونَ لِلنَّاسِ كُنُوا عِبَادًا لِي Allah says it's absolutely impossible and inconceivable that I should give the kitab and hukm and nubuwa to a slave of mine. And then he should go and go around telling people that, look, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I will deal with him. You make me the focus of your devotion. Become my slaves. كُنُوا عِبَادًا لِي Devote yourself to me. Be my slaves. Be all about me. Make me your focus. Which is what is happening in our communities today. All the focus is on building your relationship with the Imam. What about relationship with Allah? No mention of that. Make the Imam your focus. Everything the focus is the Imam. Who will cure you when you are sick? Look at Ibrahim a.s. in Surah Al-Shu'ara. إِذَا مَرِضْتُ فَهُوَ يَشْفِينَ When I become sick, who cures me? Nuh a.s. cures me. Or Adam a.s. cures me. What does Ibrahim say? He says, وَإِذَا مَرِضْتُ فَهُوَ يَشْفِينِ When I become sick, it is Allah who cures me. وَالَّذِي هُوَ يُطْعِمُنِي وَيَسْقِينِ He is the one who feeds me and gives me water to drink. وَالَّذِي هُوَ يُمِيتُنِي وَيُحِينِ He will give me death, he will give me life. وَالَّذِي أَطْمَعُ أَنْ يَغْفِرَ لِي خَطِيئَةِ يَوْمَ الدِّينِ It is him in whom I place hope that he will forgive my mistakes on the day of judgment. Not anyone else. This is the Rabbaniya, the, the true Allah-focusedness that the Qur'an promotes. Ibrahim is a role model in the Qur'an. And the same message you find, the Ahlul Bayt, they say the same thing in their du'as. They say, Allah, our connection is with you. You are our everything. You are our guardian, our lord, our savior, our protector, the grantor of our wishes. Everything, it's you and you alone. That is Tawheed, my dear brother and sister. It is not Tawheed that you start, you replace Allah and then you say, Ya, ya Imams, you are my everything. You are my guardian, you are my protector, you are my everything. The Imams will reject this on the day of judgment. They will say, Qalu Subhanaka, Ma kana yanbaghi lana anna takhida min dunika min awliya. Say, Allah, we never took anyone as awliya besides you. So how could, how can it be said that we taught anyone to take us as awliya besides you? When we ourselves did not take anyone as our guardian and protector besides you. 
then how could we preach something to other people which we are not practicing ourselves? Because our practice, as is clear from our seerah and sunnah <coughs> and literary legacy and heritage, is that we only ever supplicated to you. We only ever invoked you. We considered you to be our guardian and protector and our lord and savior and everything. You are our everything. You are our wakil and our wali. We never promoted anything other than this. So that's what Allah is saying here, that any agent of mine whom I give the kitab and I give hukum and I give nubuwa, it is impossible that he will then come and tell you that forget about Allah or put him on the side or, or let me deal with Allah. You just, all your supplication, du'as, give them to me. Make me the focus. Give me all the importance. Impossible, Allah says. So, Ya Allah, if it's impossible, then tell us what is, what will a, a true agent who has come from you, a true representative of yours, how, what will his discourse be like? Allah says, I'll tell you what his discourse will be like. He will tell you that Walakin kunu rabbaniyin. A true messenger who has come from me will tell you to be a rabbani. What is the meaning of rabbani? It's from rab, someone who is lost in the rab, someone who is consumed by the remembrance of the rab, someone who is all about Allah, 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 rab, rab, rab. Rab is the rab is all he's concerned about. His focus, his attention does not go to the slaves. It's all about Allah. And even when he goes to the slaves, he goes to learn from them about the Rabb. That is the real purpose of the Prophets and Imams. To tell you about the Rabb. Not to, not to take all the sifat of Allah and say that Allah has given them to us so now we are the Rabb by His permission and now you, you worship us and you devote yourself to us and you beg us and plead with us and make us the focus of your existence. Forget about Allah. Na'udhu bin. Allah says, impossible. My slaves will teach you this. Imma kana, Allah says, is absolute impossibility. And this, my dear brothers and sisters, this verse is the biggest tool of, of Ilm al rijal and hadith that we have. Any hadith which you see, any narration where you see that the Imam is appearing to promote himself and he's telling you, pray to me, supplicate to me. Or he's saying, he's claiming that he has attributes of Allah, powers of Allah. Understand 100% this is not the narration of the Imam. This is the fabrication of the Qulat. And I can confirm this because we have studied all these kinds of narrations. Everywhere you go in the chain, you find a notorious Ghali who was actually cursed by the Imams or discredited by the classical scholars. There's not a single narration in which supernatural attributes or powers are attributed to the Imams, except that when you examine the chain, you see a Ghali in it. And not a Ghali that I am claiming. No, no, the classical... Scholars have dismissed, they've said, Baba, don't take this guy's narrations. So if the classical scholar said, don't take his narrations, then what happened? Why today they are mentioning them from the member? Because in between you and the classical period is the Safawid period, during which there was a massive campaign to resurrect and revive all the discredited Ghali fabrications that had been thrown away. They were resurrected in the, in the Safawid period. And they were given legitimacy and they were circulated and today the Shiism of today is an extension of the Shiism of the Safavid period and that is why what was what was popular then what has circulated then is still in circulation today and that's why reformist efforts are needed to once again those narrations which were discredited by the classical scholars we need to bury them again and, and expose it to the people that these narrations are discredited narrations don't base your deen and your understanding of Imams on those discredited narrations. Otherwise, you will, of a certainty, inevitably, you will end up in deviation. Yeah, because obviously, if you're going to accept the narrations of people who were expelled from the city of Qom for lying and fabricating narrations against the Imams, so obviously, if you accept their narrations as you see traditional scholars doing today, naturally, you're going to end up with a completely Ghali ideology. And this is what has happened today. So in any case, our job is to Present the truth. We have presented it to you. Allah has made it very clear that a prophet of mine, a messenger of mine, a slave of mine, who is truly my representative, will never teach you to make him the focus of your devotion and your servitude and your slavery and your worship. Mm -mm. He will never do that. What will he do? He will teach you to become someone who is fully focused on Rabb, on the Lord, the real Lord, that is Allah. Why is he going to do that? Allah says, Bima kuntum al-kitab. Because this is what you have been teaching in the book. When you teach the book, the Quran, this is what the Quran is. From beginning to end, this is what the Quran promotes. 
that the Rabb is only Allah. The one controlling the universe is Allah. The one you make dua to is Allah. The one who cures you when you are sick is Allah. The one who responds to your call when you are distressed is Allah. Everything is Allah. The slaves of Allah, they may show miracles as a one-time thing or a two-time thing. But it doesn't mean they have permanent powers. Just because Isa alayhi salam was able to cure the blind, doesn't mean today a blind man should make start making dua. Ya Isa, Allah has told me in the Quran that you used to cure the blind. Please cure me now. No. They were blind people during the time of Rasulullah. Rasulullah never taught them to pray to Isa alayhi salam and say that, well, Allah has mentioned in the Quran that he was given this power. Yes, he was given this power as a one-time miracle. Isa alayhi salam, first of all, he was not able to cure all the blind people. Just a some blind people. So as a miracle. But this was not a permanent power that he God has given him until the day of judgment and he's sitting in a in a chair receiving applications from blind people and constantly healing and curing. Now the Christians obviously when you go to their churches, some of them they'll say, Oh, they'll give you stories, they'll show you live demonstrations that in the name of Jesus we heal you. And the blind person starts looking and he's like, Oh, I can see now. Yeah, all of that and, and similar anecdotes you will hear in every community which claims that entities other than Allah can do these things. Within the Shia community, you will hear stories of how Mawla Abbas gave somebody awlad, offspring, and how Bibi, I don't know, Bibi Fatima sallallahu alayhi cured him of his sickness. And these kinds of anecdotes you'll find in every community. The argument that works for every community, you already know it must be false. Because if it works for every community, including communities that you yourself consider to be deviant, <laughs> then that is food for thought for you. Then how come you know, how come this is working for everyone, right? Because the Hindu is also saying that I went to that so-and-so mandir and I got cured. Or I didn't have children, I got children. So basically, Allah in the Quran, he tells you, I am the ultimate giver. And in Surah An-Nahl, for example, he says, وَمَا بِكُمْ مِنْ نِعْمَةٍ فَمِنَ اللَّهِ There is not a single blessing or bounty or good thing in your life except that it is from Allah. That is what the Quran promotes. These Arifanis, these traditional scholars, they'll bring you other theories. No, there is concept of wasata al fayl Everything that Allah gives you that is good, He gives you through the Ahlul Bayt. The Ahlul Bayt are the wasita of fayl There's no basis for this in the Quran. Allah says, مَا بِكُمْ مِنْ نِعْمَةٍ فَمِنَ اللَّهِ Every ni'mah is from Allah. He makes no mention of any wasata or wasita or any of the... Every ni'mah is from Allah. And you find the Imams repeating the same thing in their du'as. Imam Ali bin Abi Talib in the Ta'qibat, what does he teach you to say after Maghrib? Allahumma ma bina min ni'matin fa min ahli al-bayt or fa min ka la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa tubu ilik. Imam Ali in the du'a is teaching you, he's saying you say Allahumma ma bina min ni'matin. Ya Allah, there is no ni'mah in my life, no good thing, no blessing, no bounty in my life. Faminka, except that it has come to me from you. And he makes no mention of any wasipa. He says, it has come to me from you, that's the only thing that's worthy of being mentioned here. Every good thing in my life is from you. La ilaha illa anta, there is no God except you. Astaghfiruka wa tubilik, I turn to you with forgiveness, I seek your forgiveness and I turn to you with repentance. This is the teaching of the Imam. It's confirmed by the Quran in Surah An-Nahl chapter 16. Allah is saying the same thing. وَمَا بِكُمْ مِنْ نِعْمَةٍ فَمِنَ اللَّهِ Every ni'mah in your life is from whom? Who do you give credit for that ni'mah to? These people want to say, no, you give credit to Ahlul Bayt with the permission of Allah. So why are you bringing the Ahlul Bayt in between? Ahlul Bayt never claimed that we are the source of every ni'mah. If you go into the fabricated narrations, yeah, you will find all kinds of claims. But those Ahlul Bayt themselves warn you, don't accept these. Accept what the Quran is telling you. The Quran is telling you, وَمَا بِكُمْ مِنْ نِعْمَةٍ فَمِنَ اللَّهِ there's no need to insert anyone else in between this equation. Whatever good is in your life is from Allah. Full stop. And then when affliction, when misfortune, when calamities befall you, you go running to whom? To Allah. Not to the Ahlul Bayt. When difficulty, misfortune befalls you, who do you rush to? You rush to Allah. And then Allah says, Summa ida kashafa durra ankum. So he's describing the reality that human beings, when they're afflicted with calamity, who do they when the calamity reaches the climax, who do they turn to? They turn to Allah because they know no one else can help them except Allah. But then Allah says, Summa ida kashafa durra ankum, when I relieve you of your distress and your difficulty, ida fariqum minkum bi rabbihim yushrikun. There is a group of 
people among you who start doing shirk, who start associating partners with Allah. How? Allah relieved you of your difficulty. But when it comes to assigning credit for this, you say, no, no, no. With the permission of Allah, Mawla Abbas removed my difficulty. Or Bibi Fatima sallallahu alayhi wa removed my difficulty. Or Mawla Ali Mushkil Kushar re re relieved me of my difficulty. This is shirk. Allah is saying, I am removing the difficulty. You are attributing it to whom? To someone else. The Imams were so strict that you have narrations from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam saying that even if you say something along the lines of Lawla Fulan Lahalaktu, this is also a kind of shirk. That if you did not mean for someone, so and so, I would have been destroyed. So no, no, no. The Sahabi says, can I say, Lawla an manna Allahu alayya bi fulan illa halaktu. Okay, so can I say that if Allah had not favored me, if he had not helped me through this person, then I would have been destroyed. The Imam says, okay, that is okay. If within natural means, you are attributing uh, this to someone who really came to your help through natural means, no problem. But across the curtain of life, it is not established that any entity can help you. So you cannot attribute credit across the curtain of life to anyone other than Allah. So in any case, Allah has made it very clear in verse 78 of Surah Ali Imran that a true messenger of mine will only ever tell you that وَلَكِنْ كُنُوا رَبَّانِيِّينَ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تُعَلِّمُونَ الْكِتَابِ You should become Rabbani. Unfortunately, in our communities, there's so many people who proudly boast and say, Oh, look at that person. He's such a nice maulai. He bought maulai. So maulai is a phrase that they have coined in opposition to the phrase that Allah is promoting in the Quran. Allah in the Quran is saying, is he telling you to be maulai? Maulai means someone who is completely crazy about the imams. Whose full devotion is to the imams. Allah in the Quran is saying that my chosen ones will only ever teach you to be kunu maulawiyina or they will, they will teach you kunu rabbaniyin. Allah is telling you that my chosen ones will only ever teach you to be a Rabbani, to be someone who is all focused on Allah, who is all about Allah. And these anti-Islamic agents, they will teach you, no, 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 Allah put him on the back burner, na'udhu billah. You become Mawlai, you become, you know, all about Jesus, be crazy about Jesus, that one will tell you, be crazy about so-and-so, uh, God or so-and-so, demigod. And the Quran's message is, be Rabbani. The next thing Allah tells you in verse 79, He says, uh, sorry, 79 and 80, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, وَلَا يَأْمُرَكُمْ أَن تَتَّخِذُوا الْمَلَائِكَةَ وَالنَّبِيِّينَ أَرْبَعَةً It is inconceivable. Just as it is inconceivable that a messenger of mine, a chosen one of mine, would tell you to make him the object of your slavery and your worship and your devotion, your supplication, your everything, just as this is impossible, the other thing that is impossible is for an agent of mine, Allah is saying, for an agent and representative of mine to come and tell you that arbaba, that he should come and tell you that you should stop taking angels and prophets as arbab, as lords besides Allah. And what does it mean to take someone as a lord besides Allah? By giving him the sifat of rububiyah, lordship. Why do we say Allah is our Rabb? Because he's the one giving us rizq. He's the one who gives us offspring. He's the one who gives life and death. He's the one who is nurturing and sustaining the universe. You take all these sifat of rububiyah, you give them to the imam, you say, yes, it's all with Allah's permission. Guess what? The whole rububiyah you have transferred to whom? To the imams. And what is Allah telling you? My chosen ones are never ever going to teach you to stop taking the angels and the prophets as arbab, as lords, as people who have these supernatural powers that they can help you and benefit you and give you risk and offspring and fulfill your needs and your hajjad and all of these things. Allah is saying, my agent will never tell you this. bil kufri antum muslimun. Allahu Akbar. This last part of the verse is really scary. Allah says, and how can it be that my agent will tell you this? My messenger will come and tell you that no, Allah has given me all his lordship, sifat, he has given them to me. So you just worship, worship me, supplicate to me, show your slavery to me, beg. When you want to beg, beg, beg from me. Come and stand in front of me for hours and, you know, beg in front of me, humble yourself before me. You think my agent will, will promote himself at my expense like that? Allah is saying. Allah says, 
you know, have you lost your mind? My agent will teach you that you should abandon me and you should focus on him. And you should make him the object. You should take all the sifat of Rububiyah and give to, to him. Ayamurukum bil kufr. You think he is he's going to command you to and invite you towards kufr after ba'daid antum muslimun, after you have become Muslims? And in other words, this is a very dangerous uh, thing that this, the Quran is pointing us towards. Very dangerous for our salvation. Allah is saying that if you end up believing, He's implying that if you end up believing that entities other than Allah have sifat of rububiyyah, such as creating, sustaining, and such as you know taking care of all your affairs, if you end up believing in this after you are a Muslim, then this is kufr ba'd al-Islam. Yeah, because the verse is saying that our Prophet will never teach you this. You know why he won't teach you this? Because ayamurukum bil kufri ba'd al-Islam muslimun. You think he's going to teach you kufr after you become Muslim? In other words, anyone who teaches you that your focus, remove your focus from Allah, put it on the Imams. You know? When you want to ask, ask the Imams. You want risk, ask the Imams. You want awlad and offspring, ask Mawla Abbas or some other entity other than Allah. You want uh, your distress or your difficulties to be relieved? Ask the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. Anyone who is turning your focus away from Allah, from the message of Kunu Rabbaniyin, be Rabbaniyin, be all about Allah, be focused on Allah. Anyone who diverts your attention from Allah, tries to take it to either the angels, because in the past angels also used to be worshipped and people used to think that angels are very powerful beings. So, you know, let us supplicate to them, let us seek their intercession. So if you do that with angels or if you do that with the prophets, even if you divert your attention away from Allah, even to his own chosen prophets, Allah says, bil kufr. This is kufr. And anyone who invites you to do this is inviting you towards kufr after you have become Muslims. Because this is the ultimate kufr when you when you share all of when you transfer all the sifat of Allah. You are setting up whoever you are giving the sifat of Allah to, you've made him an equal with Allah. Even if you say that no Allah with his permission has given us, hey, that, that does not help you, my dear. You still you've made him an equal with Allah. And you can shout and scream that no, 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 I've done it. I believe he's lesser than Allah, but Allah, <laughs> the reformist scholars say you took every power of Allah, you gave it to him. So what, what is left for Allah now? <laughs> so it doesn't matter what you say with your mouth. In in reality, practically speaking, you have given the whole lordship of Allah, and that's why you look at our communities. You look at our people, they are all about Imam, Imam, Imam. They are they become really Mawlai instead of Rabbani. Rabbaniya has completely eroded from our communities. You don't hear mention of God, you don't see it on people's mouths. And this, the way I see it, this is gonna this is only going to keep on increasing in our communities. Because many scholars who know about this are not speaking about it, because they're doing taqiyya. They fear controversy. Many of the scholars who are speaking about it, they are getting banned. They are being marginalized. They are being labeled that, you know, Tame Wahhabi Cho, Tame Acho, you are this, you are that. Ah, yeah, fine. <laughs> There's, we don't stand anything to lose. People accept, people don't accept. As long as we have presented, we have warned you that this is munafin li rabbaniya, this is against what the Quran is, has taught you, and this is uh, in the language of the Quran, this is kufr. It's not the kind of kufr that makes you najis, but it is a kind of kufr that it's, it's a height of ingratitude. It's that kind of kufr. But it is kufr at the end of the day. So, our job is to warn, and inshallah, we have warned. We hope that this message reaches as many people as possible. And uh, we hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives us for whatever shortcomings that have. Uh, but ultimately, we are humans. No reformer, no reformist is ideal or infallible. Or So we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if we've said something, if sometimes what we say comes across as harsh, sometimes people say that, you know, using labels like kufr and shirk and ghulu, this will offend people. That, say, Baba, what, you know, it's, it's like, you know, if I'm a faqih and someone asks me, is drinking alcohol haram? And is it a sin? Is it rebellion against Allah? And I know that there are some people in the audience who do drink alcohol. So what, what do you expect me to do? You expect me to, to say that, okay, I can't say it. You know, I know it is haram, of course. The Quran has made it haram. But 
if I say it is haram, then you know some people are going to get offended because they are heavy, dr you know, heavy drinkers. So, no, my dear, if I'm a true faqih, I cannot change the ruling just to avoid offending people. Something that Allah has labeled as kufr and as wulu or shirk in the Quran. I have no option but to, and that's why I'm not the one labeling, and I don't believe in labeling people. Don't, all those people who are calling upon the imams, we don't say they are mushrik. We say they are doing shirk, but we don't call them mushrik. So there's a difference. You know, we condemn the sin, and we disassociate ourselves from the sin. We criticize the sin, not the sinner. The sinner, we pray to Allah, like, Allah, these people, most of them, bichara, they are innocent. They have been misguided, they have been brainwashed, they have been fooled into thinking that the Imams will become happy if you pray to them. And this is a good way to establish a stronger connection with the Imams. They have been fooled, which are also. We earnestly hope and we, we make the dua of Ibrahim a.s. Ibrahim a.s. was equally, if not more, he was really distressed to see the, the idol worship that was going in his time. So he said, Pointing to the idols, he says, Rabbi innahunna adlalna kathiran minan nas. He says, Allah, these idols have caused so many people to deviate. Because in his time, shirk was the norm. Idol worship was the norm. So he says, Rabbi innahunna adlalna kathiran minan nas. He says, Allah, these, these idols have ended up misguiding so many people. فَمَنْ تَبِعَنِي فَإِنَّهُ مِنِّي So, Ya Allah, whoever follows my example and abandons these idols and worships you alone, then he's one, he's, he's like my blood and my flesh. He's one of me. He's part of me. Woman asani, but whoever disobeys me. He doesn't say, Allah, whoever disobeys me, throw them in the fire of hell, huh? Let them burn in hell forever. No, he says, Woman asani, whoever disobeys me and worships these idols, rahim. Say, Allah, you are ghafur rahim. And he's hoping for forgiveness. So Ibrahim alayhi salam. And all of us, this is what befits us. This is the akhlaq and the attitude and the mind frame that befits us. That even if someone is doing shirk, even if someone is doing something that we know 100% is wrong, from the teaching of Ahlul Bayt, we know it is wrong. We still wish them well. We don't condemn the person. We don't label the person. I'm not labeling anyone as mushrik or kafir or no, no. We don't do takfir. We are completely against this. Do not target or attack the sinner. The sinner, you are supposed to help. Help him out, guide him, present him the evidence. Even if he curses you and abuses you, you respond with evidence. But don't condemn the sinner, don't curse the sinner, don't abuse the sinner, don't attack the sinner. The sinner we pray for, we pray for, we make dua, earnest dua. Ya Allah, this sinner, bicharo, he has not understood. His mind is not able to digest. He's got to make it easy for him to accept the truth. Before he falls into destruction and destroys his akhirah. So all those of our community members, we don't look at them with contempt or we don't say, we feel sad for them. That is the only genuine feeling that we can describe for such people is we are sad for them. Genuinely, honestly, Allah, honest to God, we are sad for them. And for the speakers and preachers who, who attack us for trying to present the truth, we feel sad for them. They feel sad for us. So we feel sad for them. That is the most way. But we don't have any hatred. We don't have any hard feelings. Even they curse us, abuse us. Say, so, Allah, we, you know, we forgive them. And, you know, we assume that they're doing it in good faith. But we are really saddened by the fact that, you know, they have fallen into this. Now, the only problem is Ibrahim al Islam, he says that, you know, Waman Asani Rahim. Whoever disobeys me, Ya Allah, you are Ghafur Rahim. He's appealing to Allah's forgiveness. But the problem is that, yes, this is what befits us. But at the same time, Allah has announced in the Quran that Ibrahim can pray and you can pray and you can wish as much as you want to. I have made my decision very clear. I'm not going to change it. In two places in the Quran, Surah An-Nisa, verse 48, and the same Surah An-Nisa, verse 160, Allah announces in very clear words, in Allah la yaghfiru ayn yushraka bihi. He is the Ghafur Rahim Rabb. He is the very forgiving, very merciful Lord. But he is saying that I am announcing in Allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bihi. I will not forgive shirk. I will not forgive and pardon that any entity be associated with me. 
And apart from this, I'm going to forgive everything else. And this is why, my dear brothers and sisters, Shaitan has gotten, he has got you where? He's, he will try to get you where? Shirk. Because he knows everything else Allah can forgive. And he will, he may forgive on the day of heaven. But Shirk is the one thing that Allah has guaranteed he will not forgive in the hereafter. Here in the dunya, he can forgive. All the people who became Muslim during the time of the Prophet, most of them were mushrikeen. Allah forgave them because they repented in this world. When Allah says he will not forgive shirk, he means in the hereafter. Because here he's inviting you, throughout the Quran, he's inviting the mushrikeen. Come back, I will forgive you, I'll accept you, accept Tawheed, repent from your shirk, I will accept you any day of the week. You don't necessarily have to come on, on a Friday. Monday, Tuesday, any day you repent, Allah will accept you. So my dear brothers and sisters, let us repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let us, even if you're not convinced, take the path that is the safest. No scholar worth his salt from the school of Ahlul Bayt or any other school in the Muslim Ummah can tell you that if you don't supplicate and don't make dua to the Ahlul Bayt, Allah will throw you in hell. There is no, not even a fabricated hadith that, that proves this. So if you spend your life only asking Allah the way that Ahlul Bayt did in their authentic du'as, the way we are promoting, you don't have anything to lose. Allah is not going to question you. Why did you not pray to them? Say, ya Allah, where in the Quran did you teach us to pray to them? Is it no, no, what about the hadith narrations? Say, ya Allah, the ulama told us they did the research. They didn't even have sanad to prove that this is from the Imam. So how could we accept this? And besides, you told us what, what was this verse doing then in the Quran? If you wanted us to invoke them, then what were you doing in the Quran telling us, Udu'uni astajib lakum. Call upon me, I will answer you. For what reason did you then tell us to call upon you? If you wanted us to call upon them, the Ahlul Bayt, and then they will forward our supplications to you, they will intercede on our behalf to you, then you should have told us to call upon them. Well, what is this verse then? How do you explain this verse in the Quran? So, absolutely Allah cannot hold you, hold it against you that you follow the verse of the Quran. So that's why the safest side, my dear brothers, even if you are confused, you know, the other side is presenting shubuhada, Follow the safest path. Safest path is call upon Allah. Every scholar, no scholar can tell you that Allah will throw you in the fire of hell because you only ever prayed to him. No scholar will tell you that. But I can line up a whole list of scholars, mujtahideen, like Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad said, Fadlullah and others, Ayatollah Sheikh Haider Habbullah and others who will testify that if you call upon entities other than Allah, even if they are prophets, imams, angels, then this is something that goes against the teaching of Ahlul Bayt and you can get into very severe trouble, including if you go by certain verses of the Quran, you can actually end up in hell for involving yourself in this practice. So what is the safe side? You have two glasses of water. One, everyone is saying this is 100% pure. You can drink it. No harm. One, you have one group of scientists who are telling you this glass of water has a substance in it that is poisonous. It can kill you. Another group of scientists is saying, no, 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 actually the research on this is, we are not convinced by it. You can drink this. Out of the two glasses of water, which are you going to drink? <laughs> I don't know about you, I'm going to drink the water that everyone is agreed is 100% safe. And then even if I, if it turns out that water was poison, at least I can prove to Allah that, ya Allah, this is not suicide, okay? Because, you know, all the research, available research was showing me that this water is pure. So I, that's why I went for what I knew to be pure. And I did not go for the shubuhat. I did not go for that water which was, you know, if you drink water that is suspected to be poisoned, then you can be accused of suicide. But if you drink water that everyone is agreed is pure, even if you die after drinking that glass of water, no one can accuse you of willfully and deliberately committing suicide. Not, the, not least Allah. So in the same way, if you only make dua to Allah, the whole ummah will testify that you are in the clear. If you engage in these shirki practices, which <clears throat> the ulama themselves, many of them are saying this is completely un-Islamic, this is a complete new innovation. And others are saying, no, no, it is perfectly okay, we can justify it, you know, we're saying Allah has given them these power, all of these things. But you still have dispute. Then you, the likelihood of destruction and damnation in the hereafter is there. And what if it turns out to be true? Then you are gone. So that's why the path of wisdom, the requirement of wisdom is play it safe, even if you're not convinced. See, we are completely convinced by the evidences. So for us, it's not even a question of playing it safe. When we only do dua to Allah, it's not because we are playing it safe. No, we know 100% that this is the only method that the Ahlul Bayt taught, that the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam promoted, that the Quran promotes. We know that 100% with absolute certainty. So for us, we are not playing safe. 
we know 100% that there is only one path that is permissible. All the other paths that go to Ghayrullah, they lead to shirk and they have been condemned by the very awliya that you are supplicating to. So for us, it's a matter of certainty. But I'm talking to those lay people who are not so sure, who are sitting on the fence and quite sure, they're confused. They say, no, the evidence on this side is compelling. The evidence on that side, we don't know what to do. You don't know what to do? Follow the safest path. Follow the path that everyone is agreed on and abandon as Imam Al-Hasan Al-Mujtaba sallallahu alayhi narrates this hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam whereby he's reported to have said that ma yaribuka ila ma la yaribuka Abandon if there are two paths. One path is dodgy and doubtful and shady. The other path is clear. Rasulullah says abandon the path that's unclear, that's dodgy, that is suspect and follow the path that is, that is free of doubt. So you're following the guidance of Ahlul Bayt if you're and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam if you are adopting this policy. So at the end of the day, my dear brothers and sisters, um, our duty is to present the research, present the evidence, which we have done, inshallah, hopefully you listen to it, you examine it critically, don't just accept it because we are saying it, who are we at the end of the day? I am nothing and I don't have any hujjiyya, I don't have any authority, you know, you can... I don't mind you calling me a kid. I will always be a kid when it comes to uh, the tower of knowledge that the Ahlul Bayt have left. I find myself, even after having spent the best part of my life studying all of that, I still feel I'm a kid. So I'm not the least bit offended by anyone calling me a kid. And I would not be the least bit offended if you said that, you know, I cannot trust you because you're just a kid. No problem. Don't trust anyone. Don't trust the kids. Don't trust the adults. Look at the evidence that they are presenting. If the evidence a kid is presenting, <clears throat> the Quran teaches you even if a baby presents you with correct evidence, <clears throat> which has Sultan from Allah accepted. Isa salam, was a baby in the cradle when he said, Inni Abdullahi atani al kitab wa ja'alani nabiyya wa ja'alani mubarakan aynama kuntu wa awsani bis salati wa zakati madum tu hayya. Isa alayhi salam was a baby in the cradle when he said, I am a slave of Allah. He has given me the book and he has made me a Nabi. So when Allah was making that baby say these words, he expected the people to believe those words. So basically the message of the Quran is even if a baby utters the truth, you accept it. You don't reject it. And even if a very old elderly person, if he tells you something that goes against what Allah has revealed, goes against common sense, goes against the established teachings of Ahlul Bayt, then you reject it without hesitation. So, inshallah, hopefully, the, uh, the, this message reaches our brothers and sisters and they ponder over it. Don't, don't just take it because I'm saying it. I have no authority. I'm not a prophet or an imam or infallible or anything. I can make mistakes. And it is up to you to analyze and assess and evaluate what I am saying. Don't look at what people are saying about me or what you know, whether it's good stuff, whether it's bad stuff, if all the, the whole world testifies that Sayyid is the greatest alim in the world, for example, hypothetically speaking, but after that I say something wrong, it is not going to make it right. The fact that the whole world is testifying that I'm a very great alim is not going to make my wrong right. And if the whole world testifies that he is a liar and a deviant and all of that, but if I'm speaking the truth, and if I am speaking from the Quran and speaking from the authentic established teachings of Ahlul Bayt, which have been authenticated by our own top scholars, if I'm presenting the truth, the whole world testifying against me and saying he's a liar and a deviant and this and that is not going to make the truth that I'm presenting a lie. It's as simple as that. So don't go by what people say about people. Go by the evidence that they're presenting. And I'm not saying just listen to one side. Listen to both sides. Evaluate, examine, do your own study, do your own research into the Quran and Sunnah and establish teaching of Ahlul Bayt And then ultimately, when you appear in the court of Allah, at, at least you should be able to defend your positions, to show Allah. So me personally, when I, my whole research has been geared towards what? That when I appear before Allah, every single thing that Allah questions me, my manhaj and my methodology is that I will not believe in anything that Allah has not authorized. So on the Day of Judgment, inshallah, when I appear for judgment in the court of Allah, I have prepared myself, I have trained and researched in such a way 
that for each and every single claim and belief that I have, if Allah questions me, on what grounds did you believe in this? I can show him clear, explicit testimonies of himself in his book and say, ya Allah, I only believed in this because you said this and you said this in clear, in clear, plain Arabic, which was understandable to all. So that's why I accepted this. Every single belief of mine, I can justify it from my book that Allah has given me. And this is what you should also try to do. Make sure everything you believe in has support and authorization from Allah in the book itself. Otherwise, you have no case in the court of Allah. When Allah asks you, the way he will ask the Christians, where is your, you claim that Isa is the son of God, where is your proof? Now they bring the Bible, Allah can show them, your Bible was proved by your own scholars to have been changed and adulterated and distorted. So the best researches in, in biblical studies have shown how the Bible was tampered with and changed. Same thing in our case, if you show Allah dua tawassul and say Allah this dua was attributed to the Imam, Allah can show you the top scholars of Rijal have said this is it doesn't have a salad. You cannot even prove, you don't even know which Imam this is from. Allah Majlisi who mentions this, min ahadil aim, must have been from one of the Imams. We don't know, we, we don't have a chain. So Allah will say you accepted a chainless dua that you could not even prove to be from the Imam. And you, you, you're presenting this as evidence in my court. When my book was so clear, my book which you had received with thousands of chains, I had told you clearly, don't call on the masajid alillahi, فَلَا تَدْعُمْ اللَّهِ أَحَدَةً Masajid are only for Allah, don't invoke or call upon or supplicate to any entity other than Allah. When I had told you all of that, you still dismissed and rejected what I told you in the book, and you went for a dua that doesn't even have a chain that even your scholars could not prove to be from the Imam. So what were you thinking? So ultimately, this is the best we can do, is to warn our people and to tell them that Please read your Quran, read the guidance of Ahlul Bayt, read the Seerah and Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abandon all those beliefs for which you don't have Sultan and authorization from Allah. Otherwise, you will get in trouble. And that is, inshallah, throughout our life, as long as Allah keeps, our, keeps us alive, the purpose of these lectures is not to create any fitna, division, controversy. Wallahi, I'm the furthest people. The whole reason why I'm not doing this from a mainstream member is because there the potential for fitna and controversy is greater and it's not that I did I never thought of this I thought of this but the Jamaats wherever I went <clears throat> the impression that you get from these Jamaats is the Jamaats always beg you so please do not raise any controversies from our member because it's it's unfair to the Jamaat when you raise this controversy or, or you discuss any controversial matter from the member <clears throat> you the Maulana the, obviously in our communities in our culture the Maulana is respected Maulana people will come and kiss your hand and they'll be like subhanallah and wahwa and all of that. No one is going to come and do anything to you. This is what the Jamaats and it's a very legitimate argument of the Jamaats. They say, you know, you, you can come and recite whatever you want from the member. You will recite for your 10 days, your 30 days, 15 days and then you will pack your bags and fly. Who has to bear the brunt? We have to bear the brunt. Then why did you invite such a speaker? So I said, okay, no problem. If, you, if, the, if this is going to if my speaking and sharing these crucial researches which are necessary for the salvation of our people, if this is going to, if you feel that, you know, I'm throwing you under the bus and I'm doing this at your expense, then fine, I will not do it from your platform. And that's why I will remain silent until I'm able to find a platform where the administration is such that they say, no, we don't care about what the people say. You know, They don't care about the blame of those who blame because they care about Allah more. Once I find a platform like this, and it's not like I'm blaming the Jamaat. I understand uh, how our communities are. So I'm not blaming the Jamaat. So they bichara, I sympathize with them. You know, I, I don't have any hard feelings or any, I don't hold them culpable or guilty or, you know, I understand bichara. This is how it works. You know, I can recite, I can present this whole series from, uh, from the pulpit. No one is going to come and, you know, attack me and say to what are you doing? No, me, they will kiss my hands. Say, no, Sayyid, you know, he's Sayyid. We will not uh, abuse him or attack him. But the Jamaat that invited him, we will eat them up alive, we'll roast them. Say, Tame, why did you not, why did you? So because it's unfair to the Jamaats. So I said, fine, I will not share this research from your platform if this is, if you don't want it to be shared from your platform and if you feel it's gonna create intolerable 
uh, and unbearable problems for you fine i will i will keep this research to me until i find a platform that is ready that is brave enough that is courageous enough to allow for these kinds of discussion alhamdulillah we found that platform in the form of al-islah may allah bless them may allah preserve them and may allah increase their their uh, types in the ummah because we need such brave platforms otherwise if you don't have platforms like this all these researches these crucial there's a lot more we just have shared the tip of the iceberg there's a lot more that can be shared and uh, and it's nothing it's not that when we say a lot more can be shared it's not that there's any problem with islam the religion of islam alhamdulillah is perfectly secure the only problem is later additions that have been made due to sectarian considerations there's a lot of research that can be shared on that that's what i mean so you take my sentence to mean that oh no islam itself is you know based on unsolid or non-solid foundations no alhamdulillah the basic core of islam that we have received from rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that is available to the entire ummah that is completely secure the only problem is in sectarian beliefs that's where all the corruption and the fraud has taken place so alhamdulillah we found that platform and uh, that is why you know we tried to share all of this research from this uh, platform because we we saw them receptive to it you know they are the only ones allowing these kinds of discussions to happen so the rest of the organizations they will gag you they will stifle your freedom to speak Fine, let them do that. They have to protect their own sectarian interests. I understand that. I don't hold that against them. I'm okay with that, if that's their decision. But ultimately, these researches should reach the people. That is what I feel. And that's why, alhamdulillah, we, we found this platform. And we are sharing these researches. Alhamdulillah ta'ala, we can intend to continue sharing. As long as Allah gives us life, and He gives us the energy and the strength, we will continue sharing these researches. And we hope that Allah benefits from them and it is not our desire. As I told you, we have no intention of causing fitna, division, all of these things. We are the furthest away from it. We have no interest in that. But the reality is not sharing these researches is what's going to cause the real fitna. Because if you don't clean your own house, other people are going to come and clean it for you. Sometimes your enemies will come in and they will not clean it for you, by the way. They will just laugh at you. They'll show the world, look, their house is so dirty. They'll laugh at you. They'll discredit you. You will end up becoming a source of shame and humiliation and embarrassment for the Ahlul Bayt whose name you have given your school. And that is a big crime. It's a big crime against Ahlul Bayt. That because of you, people should view them with hatred and enmity and suspicion and think like they are the ones who promoted all these khurafat. Na'udhu billah. And that's why the appeal of Imam Zainul Abidin والسلام, to his people, the, the gulat were emerged in his time. So some of the early seeds of Gulu, they started appearing in the time of Imam Sajjad Ali Sam. Look at what he tells these people. He says, Ahibbuna, the Gulat of Kufa, he addresses them. They're not exactly Gulat, but they have inclinations towards Gulu. And the Imam can already see where they're headed. So the Imam tells them, Ahibbuna hubb al-Islam. Wala tuhibbuna hubb al He says, if you want to love us, you need to have adab. You need to have etiquette and aql. Don't love us in an insane manner. Okay? If you want to love us and show love to us, show love to us within the boundaries of Islam. Your love to us should be guided by the principles of Islam. The most important principles of Islam is Allah is the focus, not us. We are just wasila to connect you, yani to teach you. The Ahlul Bayt connect us to Allah, not by putting themselves between us and Allah, but rather by telling us that you don't need anyone between you and Allah. Allah is closer to you than your jugular vein. We will teach you his Asma'ul Husna, his beautiful names, his Sifat. We will tell you so much about him that you will develop the confidence to approach Allah yourself. Because ultimately, Allah wants to have a personal relationship with each and every single one of his slaves. That's why he has opened up the institution of Dua. That's why the Imams used to encourage it. He used to say that إِنَّكُمْ لَا تَتَقَرَّبُونَ إِلَى اللَّهِ مثلي. As Imam Sadiq salam says, nothing can bring you as close to Allah as Dua. Dua is the ultimate ibadah that brings you really close to Allah. Our relationship with Allah is based on need. We are needy. That's why we need him. That's why, you know, we have to believe in him. We have to obey him because we need him. We cannot live without. We cannot survive without his father and his grace. So because we are so utterly dependent, you, you might say, well, this is selfish. Well, call it whatever you want, but it's the truth. We are needy before Allah. We need him. And he is ghani. He doesn't need us. So we submit ourselves to him and we try to connect with him through dua because we need his grace and his bounty and his father and his forgiveness. And the Ahlul Bayt show us the best way how to connect with him. 
So that's why Imam Sajjad says, Ahibuna hubb al-Islam. We're not against love of Ahlul Bayt. The Imam is not saying don't love us, no? Love us, but with an Islamic love. Islamic love means don't set up us, so don't set us up as equals with Allah. Don't make us shuraka and junior partners of Allah. Don't transfer all the powers of Allah to us and then say, well, it's with the permission of Allah. No, with permission, without Allah has not given us this, okay? Just leave us where we are. We are slaves of Allah. We are honored people. Allah has given us a lot of honor. He's given us a lot of knowledge. He's given us insight into the deen. Benefit from that. And the Ahlul Bayt, they generously distributed their knowledge. Benefit from that. No one is stopping you from benefiting from that. Well, what the reformist scholars are stopping you from is what Imam is talking about here. He's saying, Ahibbuna hubba Islam. You want to love us? Love us with an Islamic love. A love which keeps us as slaves of Allah who are as needy before him as you are needy. This is the concept Imams promote in their du'as. Say, when they talk about du'a to Allah, they say, Ya Rabbi, kayfa yas'alu muhtajun muhtaja? Imam Sajjad says, I don't understand. How can a muhtaj, a needy person, ask a fellow needy person? How can a beggar ask a fellow beggar? The Imam is saying, we are beggars before Allah. Our whole lives we spent what? Praying to Allah, making dua to Allah. So we are beggars before Allah and you are also beggars before Allah. Now we are more intelligent beggars. So the most you can do is benefit from our style. The way we are asking Allah, the names with which we are calling upon him. You can copy us. But don't make beggars into lords besides Allah and then you forget Allah and you start calling upon them, making them the focus. Imams are against this. So Imam Sajjad says, Ahibbuna hubb al-Islam. Love us with the love of Islam. Wala tuhibbuna hubb al awthan But do not love us with the love of the idols. We don't want the idolaters love because the idol worshippers, they also love their idols. But their love for their idols causes them to set up their idols as rivals and equals for Allah. Imam says, I don't want that love. That love I'll throw on your face. I don't want that love. وَلَا تُحِبُّونَ حُبَّ الْأَوْثَانِ Don't love us like how the idol worshippers love their idols. Don't turn us into idols. We are slaves of Allah. We are proud to be slaves of Allah. We are proud of the fact that we are utterly needy and helpless before Allah. That is, a, that is what we stand for. Let us be that way. We don't like that irrational, insane love whereby you start making us into Allah or you bring us closer to Allah than we actually are. So he says, وَلَا تُحِبُّنَا حُبَّ الْأَوْثَانَ And then look at what he says after that. He says, فَوَاللَّهِ مَا زَالَ حُبُّكُمْ بِنَا حَتَّى بَغَّطْتُمُونَ إِلَى النَّاسِ This is because, وَاللَّهِ your love, he's telling the Gulat, your love has cost us dearly. You think you have benefited us with your exaggerations, which you claim are out of your love? You think you have benefited us? You have made us hateful in the eyes of the Ummah. You have made the Ummah suspicious of us because the statements, the khurafat, the nonsensical, exaggerated claims that you make about us, you cleverly attribute them to us. Yeah, You say that Imams are saying this about themselves. So then the Ummah, the rest of the Muslims, when they read all of, this, all of these exaggerated claims and they see that these exaggerated claims have been, are coming from whom? Because the ulata are attributing them to the imams. So when the ummah sees that the imams are saying these kinds of things, they start developing suspicion for the imams. They're like, maybe these imams were not right people. Maybe they were not imams of guidance. Maybe they were, you know, na'udhu billah charlatans or frauds who were all about promoting themselves instead of promoting worship and devotion to Allah. So he says, Wallahi, you, you ghulat, you have destroyed our image in the ummah. You have made us mabghuz. You have made people, people hate us because of you. And if they don't hate us, at least they've started viewing us with suspicion that Aloka, you know, these Imams, they don't look like, like, you know, legit people because all of these Khurafat that are coming from them, because they don't know that the Ghulat are fabricating, yeah, the rest of the Ummah. They see Qala Ali ibn al-Husayn, Qala al-Baqir, Qala al-Sadiq. The whole Ummah doesn't know Ilm al-Rijal that they will look at the chain and be like, oh, okay, that's the Ghali. Uh, this is not the statement of the Imam. This is definitely, this Ghali was known for fabricating. And so this, this nonsensical claim, definitely this is the Ghali who, who invented it. The Imam cannot speak so openly against the Qur'an. The Ummah doesn't have this kind of insight which we have, yeah? We know Ilm al-Rijal, so we are not fooled. But the rest of the people, they're going to think if they see Qala Sadiq, Imam Sadiq taught this diara or Imam Sadiq taught this dua which is addressed to the Imams, what is the public going to say? 
You say, okay, so these imams are promoting shirk. Ah, the Shia imams are really bad, bad imams. Na'udhu billah. That's what they're going to end up with. So alhamdulillah, in the case of the Ahlul Sunnah, their scholars are also very mature. They were not fooled. That's why I've seen in all their books, they, they mention, whenever they talk about the wulad, they say, though we have done the research, the imams of Ahlul Bayt never promoted wulu. This is all the fabrication of the wulad. So alhamdulillah, their scholars were also able to discover that the imams are not behind the wulu in Shiaism. All the wulu that's there in Shiaism came from where? From the fabrications of the wulad, not from the imams. Alhamdulillah, the Sunnis also realized that. And that's why in their writings, they write that. But in the beginning, some of the Sunni scholars, they fell into doubt and they began to discredit Imams now. So you can see the damage was still done. So in any case, my dear brothers and sisters, it is our earnest and humble prayer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give all of us the tawfiq. Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqa. Ya Allah, show us the truth. Let us recognize the truth for what it is. Wa arina al-batila batilan. And show us the batil for the batil that it is. After showing us the truth, Urzukna ittiba'a, give us the tawfiq to follow it and accept it, not to be arrogant in the face of clear evidences. And give us also the tawfiq that after we recognize the batil, that we should have the courage to reject it and to abandon it, even if our entire community and our leadership and our some traditional scholars, and even if they're supporting it, we should have the courage, the intellectual and moral courage to abandon all those things that are established to be against the Quran and teaching of Ahlul Bayt. We should have the courage to abandon them and to say no. We will follow what Allah has revealed in the Quran and what the Prophet وسلم, and the noble and pious Imams of Ahlul Bayt taught in their authentic teachings. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.